Hello, everybody, and welcome along to the latest event for the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. It's John Hindorf and the team for IMSA Radio and TV. It's a green and pleasant land that we find ourselves in this weekend on the border of North Carolina, but in Virginia. Important distinction I have found in the last few days around here. VIR first opened and carved out of the local landscape in August 1957. Carol Shelby won a GT endurance race here in a 570S. That was a Maserati that won that race. The 17 turn format of the circuit is virtually unchanged down those years and the countryside has helped dictate exactly where this track goes. There are a couple of long straights but the uh, the landscape of the area means that it's uphill and down dale as far as the drivers are concerned. It's tricky, it's challenging and the drivers absolutely love it. A huge crowd of GT enthusiasts on hand to witness the Michelin GT Challenge here at VIR. Well, hello everybody, wherever you are in the world, 89.9 around the track, XM205, Sirius 118, Jeremy Shaw and Owen Trinkler with me in the booth, and our Continental Tire Pitlane reporter is Shea Adam. The first thing we need to know, Shea, did everybody... Did everybody get out of the pit lane? Yes, they did. Every car that is slated to start will be taking the green flag as they come around to finish the first of two pace laps behind the Nissan GTR safety car. This is the time when you've got to be completely focused. Owen Trinkler, you won here yesterday in the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge for Nissan at a Nissan track. It's the GTR leading them round at the moment. No Nissans for you to cheer on here, so you can be completely impartial. <laughs> GT Le Mans, Joey Hand leads them out. Has that Ford got the pace of the rest of the field? He showed it definitely yesterday in qualifying. I, I didn't join you guys during that, but the biggest thing, Joey's a great driver, got a great team there at Chip Ganassi. I think they're the ones to beat today. Uh, look for the Ferrari, though, to give him a challenge here towards the end of the race. The biggest thing here, we talked about it earlier in free practice, uh, in practice three, is stay on the track. You can't block the radiators here. Got to do a great job in the pits here, and the driver's just got to be on cue because we could go caution free here. Jeremy Shaw, GT Daytona, the change racing Lamborghini, Jerome Mull, Air Mull as we've been calling him after his airborne antics in one of the earlier sessions. That car came off the truck so strongly and it has been strong all weekend, but he's got plenty of pressure being applied from behind. He has, but if he can keep it on the black stuff and uh, on, on the ground, <laughs> uh, I think that car is going to be really hard to beat for, for this week, this uh, this afternoon. For some reason, they've got a, just an extra special handle on that car. I mean, they were super fast, also at Road America, qualified on the pole position there as well. Didn't bring it home for the win, slipped back through the field this weekend. But we focused on keeping that car out the front of the pack. The truth is, though, and for anyone who's already made their predictions on www.podiumpredictor.com, powered by IHG Rewards Club, any one of probably the top half, maybe more of GTD, could certainly be on the podium or better. And frankly, any of the top nine, Jeremy, in GT Le Mans could win this race. Yeah, oddly, the Porsches have been off the pace this weekend, and I've asked a whole bunch of people, you know, why? Uh, and nobody's really got a good answer for me, to be perfectly honest. Not, because they've been competitive everywhere else they've been this season. Just wondering whether you know, they haven't got their tie draws quite right here, perhaps, or they, uh, they just haven't got the, the car dialed into this sort of racetrack. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty unique sort of racetrack here, Owen Trent, in some ways. Uh, but, it's, it's, but it's certainly a, a traditional sort of a racetrack. It, it, it is. It's a driver's track here. Mm. you got high speed, low speed, uh, maybe a little bit of a compromise for the low speed to the high speed setup that you need as far as the aero of the cars. One thing is we get ready to come to the start here. I was in the driver's meeting this morning. They're going to line up row by row as far as we got the pole sitter GGD's at 10th. So he's going to be on the outside, though, coming to the green here. So this ah, is going to be a so challenge, not a, split grid. not a split grid here. So in the driver's meeting, Bo Barfield explained exactly what he wanted to see. And so they're going to go down through the rows here. And so the GTD pulsator is going to be on the outside here. Which is actually good for him, though, because he's going to be already at least a car let the head of the two guys, the two guys behind him. But and the GTLM cars, are they're going to out accelerate him away from the start line. So he should be in fairly good shape. Except he's got ABS going into the first corner on cold <laughs> earth tires. tires yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm. And, and we saw in practice yesterday, they can break really deep with the GTLM cars. And, uh, you know, you can hang on the outside. We took the lead right off the bat. And we started second yesterday. Yeah, great. 
great run from uh, Sarah Catani or your teammate, got right round the outside at turn one and took the lead at turns two and three. Settle back if you can, more likely you'll be on the edge of your seat. Track temperature at 89 degrees Fahrenheit in the air, it's about 81. Humidity almost 50%. It's a great looking grid as they come to the green. Oh, they've sort of, sort of got themselves sorted at the beginning, but not for, at the front of the grid, but not too much behind. One, two, three, four across the road as they come down to the first corner. And the BMW trying to go around the outside is Alexander Sims. Pullman just about hanging on in the middle. And there's a spin in the middle of the track, and that's carnage. It's the Lexus. It's the 15 car, I think, of Jack Hawksworth who went around. Yes, it is and everyone had to avoid him. He's now facing the wrong way. And then the 28 Allegra Motorsport, at the entrance to turn three is on the grass driver's right, and the BMW has muscled its way in the lead. The Munich muscle car, the V8 is ahead of Detroit's finest in the Ford GT. Then it's the second BMW and the two other Detroit cars being the uh, two Chevy Corvettes following through. And for the moment, the 62 Ferrari shuffled all the way back to seventh position in that schmozzle at the first corner. A bit of an untidy start from the midfield back, but what a start from John Edwards, Jeremy. It certainly was, around the outside of the first corner. That was exactly what he wanted to do. Exactly, he pulled it off perfectly. And he's got a pretty good lead going on to Madison Avenue here, so he's going to be looking good here. He's a really good driver, is John Edwards. Massively underrated in my book. Brilliant start by him. That might be the 25 rather than the 24. The 25 is not showing on our timing screen uh, at the moment. And, and I think that's the 25 that's leading. For some reason, it's not showing yeah, on our sorry, timing screen. Yeah, it's the car on the outside of the front row. Yeah, my, my apologies. Uh, that car slipping. It's gone so quickly, it's gone off the top of the timing screen. <laughs> Amazing start from the outside of the front row. Meantime, in GT Daytona, Jaron Mull is ahead of Lawrence Vantil, yeah. one of the GT Le Mans cars. Bleak Moulin in second place in the 33 car. Hello to Ben Keating and the rest of South Texas. Yessi Kron in the BMW number 96 is third in GTD. And still showing on our timing screens and you'll be seeing this if you're watching around the world it's, it's the joy hand car that's leading but that is not the case side by side contact for fifth and sixth uh, which is actually sixth and seventh richard westbrook and giancarlo fisichella for some reason the 25 car is not showing i wonder if he jumped the start and he got ahead now he's popped back onto the timing screen so alexander sims now scored in the lead by 1.8 seconds Whatever he did, he did it absolutely right. Great opportunity to go and treat at the start of a race to get around the outside. Not being on pole, not really a disadvantage as they went into turn one, though, all kinds of trouble in the middle of the mm. field. And Jack Hawksworth looked like he spun on his own well, from the right of the It looked like his teammate was kind of leaning on him, actually. There's, uh, there's two cars, he's kind of, yeah, okay, the, the Brian Sellers, or Madison Snow, I should say, got pincered in between the two Lexuses going in, where it funnels down there in turn one, and he kind of got pinched uh, from the uh, left rear, just spun him around. Yeah, uh, and ahead of that, Jack Keller went off the road out of turn. Number one. Count, man. Uh, the 86, uh, the 86 Acura right in the thick of the action as well. One of two people having to avoid the spinning hawks with including his teammates. A big gainer there, I think it was John Bennett who made, moved up four or five positions uh, from his starting line because he finds himself in 19th at the end of lap one. Oh, and we often talk about, you know, why is it important to qualify at the front in a race that's two hours and 40 minutes long? Because you're not in the middle of that lot right there. Yeah, that was the middle of the storm right there when uh, the Lexus got turned there. But we saw Sims, I mean, he, he's only been here a couple of times. They did a test here. And I think he said he didn't get started off too well. He had a crash maybe in that yeah. test. Man, he did a great job. But you could get so much grip coming off turn one. With that sealer they've put down, you can hang on the outside and get a good drive off and then get the inside for turn three. So not even the first 10 minutes having been completed and already some cars are having to drive back through early issues. Alexander Sims then who leads it for BMW. Joy Han for Chip Ganassi Racing in second. Then it's the second of the BMWs, John Edwards. In GTD, Jerome Blinkham-Orland has got to find a 1.3 second gap between himself, got to uh, get across the 1.3 second gap between himself and Jerome Morley. Changed racing Lamborghini from pole position, doing exactly what the pole sitter needs to do. He has been repassed, by the way, by Laurence Vantour, who's also gone back past his teammate, so he's gone up from 10th to 8th 
in a couple of laps. Serge Karam holding on to fourth position in Lexus and considering he had to avoid his spinning teammate, Jack Hawksworth, who's dropped well, all the way back down to 15th. That's a, that's a pretty good recovery. Yeah, I'm not sure how to avoid him. He was, he was squeezing up the inside uh, of Hawksworth going into turn one. So I think it was a really good aggressive start there from Sage. And uh, Jack was way on the outside, but in the middle was the uh, Paul Miller race in Lamborghini. And I think, like I say, he got, kind of got pinched in that. Sellers did a good job of backing out of it. I think there might have been just a little bit of contact on the rear end of the Hawksworth's car just to spin him around. Leader goes past up and completes lap number three in this daylight between Sims and Joey Hunt. And the daylight is now 3.2 seconds. What a start from the BMW. We saw this in qualifying though, Owen, that they bring their Michelin tyres up to operating temperature and pressures very, very quickly indeed. Uh, the BMW's fastest laps were quite early on in their qualifying session. Different cars have different characteristics of how they work their tyres when they're starting off. They do, and then, so it's, it's kind of see what the Ford does here if he starts to reel them back in. i say it's get about 20 minutes into this race and see if he starts to reel them back in. If he's on the longevity run, if he can uh, do a better job. Good pass here by Andrew Davis here. I had a good chat with him this morning after the driver's meeting. Got by the Lexus where he needed to. He said the Lexus has got the straightaway speed, and so he needed to make that move as he went into turn four there. So now he pulled a gap on him. Yeah, a little mistake by Sage Karam going through the third corner. NASCAR turn, as it's called. He drifted a little bit wide, and immediately uh, through went Andrew Davis. Uh, Shea Adam, you were talking to Alexander Sims yesterday, and he's hoping for a green, a long green flag run in the BMW. He thinks that they're only going to get stronger as the stint goes on, so the Ford needs to pick it up now if they want to try and catch back up, or maybe Alexander was just selling us a bluff because they look pretty strong off the start. Yes, they <laughs> certainly do. Yeah, I saw Alexander just a few minutes before the start. He was looking really racked, really calm, really confident. We heard from him yesterday. Shea spoke to him after qualifying, and, uh, you know, you, you, you could tell then he, he felt he was in a good place. He's certainly in a good place right now because he is uh, stretching out that lead at the front of the field. And if we do, with the potential of going full green, Owen, um, it, it, this is absolutely the right thing to do. If he can build a lead now and we don't get any full course yellows, that's just the cushion that he wants to see. The further up the road and the smaller he can get to everyone else, that's that's good news. No, definitely. Uh, I, what came to mind, John, is there is he's got a pretty good lead here if he starts conserving fuel. If we go green the rest of the way, you know, start conserving earlier in the run just to make sure you've got something there at the end. You always want to work the race backwards, so he might start conserving that fuel right now. Yeah, because he's not having to have the kind of battles that everyone behind is. Joey Hand and John Edwards, the 66 and 24 cards, Ford and BMW, right at it there. Tommy Milner's clawed right in on the back of uh, John Edwards. That's the uh, 24. And uh, uh, John Edwards, the 24, with the bright yellow Tommy Milner Corvette right in his wheel tracks. A little bit further back, West Plymouth Fizzy Keller. Fizzy really losing out in the opening exchanges and dropping all the way down from that good starting position, sitting at the moment in seventh position. The two Porsches back from that. And Lawrence Vanti are having to suffer the indignation of being headed for a little while by Jerome Mull in the Lamborghini, who's pulled out a three-second lead to Blake Mullen in the 33. That's the leading AMG card. Yes, he Kron is half a second further back. Then Andrew Davis just up into fourth position ahead of Sage Karam. Then Madison Snow for last year's winner here, the 48, the black and red Lamborghini. But this is good. We're settling down. We're getting race pace. And quick race pace at that, Jeremy. A 141.6 last time around for Alexander Sims. Yeah, and the same uh, kind of domination in GT Daytona as well. Number 16, Jerome Moore, full second quicker pretty much than the rest of the field in JT, GT Daytona last time around. So he's stretching out that margin as well. This time the gap between first and second came down a little bit because uh, Alexander Sims Ooh, it's about eight tenths of a second slower than the previous lap. It's really interesting to see why. Did we see any mistake on, uh, on track? Don't think we did, but uh, it's certainly a really handy lead he has at this stage. Yeah, he dropped off the circuit at the last corner there, Jeremy. There was quite a bit of uh, the dust oh, big that we uh, have seen when people go wide at that 17th and final corner. Very important indeed, Owen Trinkler, because You've got to get out there quick to maximize that long run across the start-finish line. You do. They've actually added some extra curbing, the, the, the green and yellow curbing on the exit there. They've actually added an extra piece there right where we track out for the left rear. So that's beneficial now that you can use a little bit of extra road there if you need it. 
Early pit stop for Kenny Abul. Not been a good weekend for the 75. Mercedes, Shea Adam, Shea Adam has this Continental Tire pit lane report. That little air gun blower that they've had has gotten a lot of use this weekend. Kenny Habul being employed by the groundskeeping crew has uh, continued that into the race and unfortunately they decided to bring him in saw that the temperatures had started to spike for that Mercedes AMG GT3 and so they are just taking their time cleaning it out. And while you were giving us that update, the 57 of Andrew Davies off the circuit. One of our big action areas this week has been running up from nine into 10, Jeremy, and he's taken a walk on the wild side, or at least a ride on the grassy side on the outside of that. Easy to do, Owen, because it's a big commitment corner there. No, it is. It looked like it happened, middle of it. figured a replay here. It happened on the entry coming in, so I don't know if there's any contact there, but I talked to Andrew earlier in the weekend. They were having issues as they released the brakes and the car was starting to get an oversteer situation. So I know the track temp's gone up about 90 degrees right now. I'm not sure if that issue's come back. I don't think they got that all the way worked out of the car a little bit. GT Daytona at the moment. Top three brought to you by the letter J. Jerome Mull, Jerome Blinker Mullen, and Jesse Krohn. And it's a problem for Andrew Davies. And it's a bad one because it's a left rear puncture. Now, question for me would be there, was that cause or effect? I had a talk with the Continental people before the race here. That may be an issue there. You know, they were having issues with the left rear and some of the Porsches here. Maybe a little bit too much camber in that left rear. Did that take him off the circuit or did he cut the inside shoulder maybe coming back on? Hard to say. Andrew Davis doing exactly the right thing though, Jeremy, and coming in at what to him will seem a ridiculously slow pace, but you can never go too slow when you've got a, a flat tyre. No, you can't because you can easily uh, compound the problem there and make uh, you know, cause suspension damage or body, major bodywork damage, whatever. So you've just got to bite the bullet there and just cruise back as... Uh, as as carefully as you can. We'll get a, a note from, uh, we'll get an update from Shea Adam. Uh, this from race control incident uh, between the 24 and 62 has been uh, reviewed. That was the first corner incident that saw Fizzy Keller off the circuit, but John Edwards has got a warning. So effectively, in soccer parlance, that's a yellow card there. We've seen you doing that. We're not going to penalise you now in the action that goes on in the first corner, but we are watching your conduct. I like that call, actually, because uh, it, yep. it's so busy at the first corner in any case. It's rarely going to do anything kind of egregious down there. Clearly, the race director decided there wasn't anything completely untoward over there. So uh, he might have made a bit of a mistake, given us a, give a slap on the wrist. I quite like that call. I think it, it brings everybody in the line. Um, I don't like them getting away with too many things, I have to say. But uh, if it was nothing, if it was kind of marginal at that stage of the race, I think it's a good idea. But what it does do, Owen, for all the other drivers, because the teams will see that as we have done and have heard it on the race direction radio they know that the guys are watching and that they've seen that they haven't just ignored it they've seen it and they've made a call on it even though it's it's not a call that has brought the penalty true and as a race driver you kind of take that and remember that in, the, in your uh, in your brain as you're driving in the race you say hey i know what i can get away with you I mean, race drivers, <laughs> we're, we're going to push the limit so you're going to find out where's that envelope there as far as with race control oh, what i can busy. do airborne that, that exactly the same thing that happened with uh, Jerome Mull outside of turn 10 and he was a full cart with none of the Michelins on the ground at that stage and he came down square on looked more like a rally driver than a race driver there my goodness he was very lucky that is super quick through turn 10 and I think he's got away with it I don't even see that he's lost any of the diffuser maybe lost a little bit of the the front end no I don't think he has my, that was, sorry to interrupt you there, uh, uh, Owen, but that was uh, very spectacular in a way that I don't think Giancarlo Fisichella would have liked it. That's going to make the highlights real early on, and that's a wake-up call for him. No, it is. The biggest thing he got away with, no grass in the front end. And we talked about that coming <laughs> well, into the race. He flew over it. But, he flew over it. But, I mean, that, that, that's huge. Now he doesn't have to come in and make that pit stop. He can settle back down and, and go fight with Westbrook here. Meantime, the number 57 Audi is in the pit lane. Tire problems for that Stevenson car. Shea has this. It pulled over into the transition lane early on, John, because the 75 Sun One Energy One car also came back from the pit lane. There's a bit of damage to the nose of that Audi as well. The radiator grate has been pushed in. 75, meanwhile, has gone behind the wall. They have a left rear and a left front Continental that they are getting ready to put onto this car. Change all four tires, give it a splash of fuel. And uh, now they 
have been forced to go on to this three-stop strategy that we heard some teams talking about earlier on before the race began. They're checking because there's a little bit of the wheel well that has come loose, and they want to make sure that this carbon will not rub on the new Continental and cause another puncture. If that was loose beforehand or due to contact on, that might be the reason that this Continental went down in the first place. Alexander Sims still leads the motor race by three and a half seconds over Joey Hunt. 25 BMW from 66 Chip Ganassi, 4 GT. Third place, another two and a half seconds further back. John Edwards in the 24 BMW from Tom Milner in the first of the two Chevy Corvettes. Four and three running four and five at the moment. Then it's the second Ford. He's nine seconds away from the leader. Richard Westbrook, though, is a past master at saving fuel. And I just wonder whether those two Chip Ganassi cars are running slightly different strategies. The 66, full out, 100%, and the 67, we know Richard Westbrook can conjure up extra fuel mileage seemingly at will. Then it's the 9-1-2 of Lawrence Vanter, up to seventh position after that slight mistake by Giancarlo Fisichella. Not being a opening of the been, race. I think there must have been another one there from Fizzy as well, because he lost the position to the, one of the portions. Yeah, and a slow middle sector yeah. again for Fizzy there. So not the opening that they were looking for. Uh, in has come the Lone Star Racing uh, number 80 car as Shea Adam out goes the 57. And very, very clever. While Andrew was stopped in the pit box, they actually had him turn off the engine to try and save just a little bit more fuel while he was stationary. These 80 came in, John, as you mentioned, the Lone Star Racing, exactly the same as the 75 Sun Energy One car. They just needed to get rid of some extra grass that was in the radiator. Ah, okay. Continental Tide pit lane report from Shea Adam. Uh, the 80 has gone back out, as has the uh, 57, Andrew Knox, uh, sorry, Andrew Davis, still aboard the 57 car. Well, after the excitement of the opening for the GTLM runners, let's bring you up to date with what's happening in GT Daytona, as Fizzy Keller is right behind Lawrence Vanter on the long back straight. Jerome Mull now by 6.6 .6 seconds. He has checked out. Yeah. That's a huge lead in the context of GT Daytona this year. And here, as Fizzy goes side by side into the roller coaster, there's a touch Ooh. on Van Tour, who just about holds his line. Fizzy muscling his way back. He is fired up. I don't think he's happy about what happened at the first corner, and he's out for revenge. And anybody that gets in his way is going to be pushed out of it. That was a strong move. That was rubbing his racing. And given that uh, the King, Richard Petty, was uh, waving or doing the command for start your engines, I think, Owen Trinkler, uh, that will have had a little nod of approval from the King there. <laughs> yeah, a little NASCAR move there in the roller coaster. It's very yeah, rare. that was, uh, I mean, he just had no regard for the car on his left hand side as he went through that kink into the roller coaster. He just cut straight across the apex where the car, no, the roller car was already there. Yeah, he wanted to move over and make room for himself, really. Yeah. And, uh, I know Shay's kind of reported that there's some grass on some other cars coming in. As we got the shot here, there's a Ferrari coming through 5A and B. There's actually some grass to the inside of the underneath the Nissan bridge here. I don't know what happened on that first lap. But if we look to the left here, if we get a good shot of it, there's actually some grass is the, where the Ferrari's coming here over to the left side there. It looks like some grass there. So Somebody's the right had an side incident. There. Somebody's had something there out there picking that up off the track. Yeah, you've got to be careful running through that because you can get dirt on the tires. I've rarely seen Fizzy uh, this fired up, certainly not for a long time. He hasn't been here for a wee while. He has been racing over in Europe in one or two GT championships. Of course, he was a winner here in 2014. And coming down that long back straight, he's fine until he starts to turn into the left-hander. The, the rule is here, Owen, that you've got to leave a car's width, and <laughs> not sure he did there. <laughs> yeah, he left it, I think he tried to push him off the track there. Yeah. Uh, if it was a car's width, it wasn't the width of a Porsche. <laughs> so, uh, the, the Porsche has very wide wheel arches, and the Ferrari doesn't. And people often ask about that. Why is the Porsche much wider than the Ferrari? It's not. The Ferrari is a wider car as standard, and the Porsche is a bit narrower. They've got a maximum width that the car can be, so the Porsche can splay itself out to that, hence the wider wheel arches. So the BMW is slightly similar to that, whereas the Ferrari is much more stock on the side of the cars because it's already a wide car to begin with. Alexander Sims has just put another fast lap of the race in, 141.5, last time around. And that's getting close to lap record pace, isn't it, Jeremy? Uh, no, it's uh, nearly a second ahead of it.
Ah. 142.4. That ship has really, sailed then yes, in well, terms of lap yeah, records. Two, two years ago, uh, it was actually 42.4 for by Pierre Caffer in the Ferrari. Uh, so uh, no surprise to see that uh, record being eclipsed. Leader going off the circuit, uh, heading through turn 10, but held onto it. It's such a fine line, Owen, here between you know, triumph and disaster. And we've said with the potential of this race being green for long periods, possibly even the whole race, these are qualifying type laps for everybody that just happen to be on full tanks. No, they're they're definitely pushing the limit here. Looks like we got some debris. I think that's coming down the back straight away here. It is, the roller it's, in coaster. The, yeah. it's in the dip just before the roller coaster. Yeah. Actually, no, yeah, oh, going no. up before uh, Oak Tree there, yeah. the old Oak Tree turn. So this track is so busy. Talked to some of the drivers this morning. They think this is busier than Sebring. You've got the bumps there and stuff at Sebring, but this track is so busy. you got slow turns, but you got the high speed S's you're coming up to. Your concentration level here has to be so high here and your car has to be spot on because this section of the track is flat out coming through here. Yeah, that's the run up to the Oak Tree turn. And 63 in the midst of it, Christina Nielsen holding on to a solid at fifth position ahead now of Serge Karam and Catherine Legg. But they are closing in the two blue cars. One, in fact, both of those cars, of course, new for 2017 in the championship with those manufacturers as well, Lexus and Acura. Acura with a couple of wins under their belt. Lexus yet to do that, but certainly have pace in that car. And it can only surely, Jeremy, be a matter of time before they get the result that they're looking for this year. Yeah, I agree. And uh, Jack Hawks is after that spin in the first corner. He's worked his way from, from right at the back of the pack, already past uh, five or six cars. He's now pretty much onto uh, well, a small train, at least. He's caught up with, uh, with Patrick Lindsay who is right with Ozzy Negri. Uh, Catherine Legg, by the way, found a way past Ozzy Negri. Number 93 was behind the number 86 for the first uh, handful of laps. Since she's got past, she's romped away a better part of a second a lap, and Catherine has now caught up to the battle between Christin, Christina Nielsen and Sage Cowan. That is for fifth place in GT Daytona. You're going to notice, Jeremy, that the 86 starts dropping back and back and back. They are already in a fuel-saving mode. The 93 is going flat out. The 86 is going to see just how long they can make this stint last. Yeah, and flat out for Catherine Legg, means trying to get past Sage Karam right on the diffuser of the blue Lexus ahead. The blue Acura is Catherine Legg. The red one is the 86 of Oz Negri. Had a little look there, couldn't make that one stick, but I'm sure she'll be back onto the rear spoiler of Oz Negri, uh, of uh, Serge Karam, excuse me, in just a couple of corners time. So many people parked up around here. As into the pit lane, John Edwards for BMW. And Shea Adam, this is not a regular stop. Behind the wall, John Hindoff, as uh, John does not come into his box. I saw about three seconds ago, actually, a pit box full of BMW mechanics hustling back to the garage. They weren't expecting him to come in. He just isn't stopping in the pit lane. No, and he's uh, hightailing it up the return road behind. Fortunately for him, their trailer is right at the pit in end of the paddock area, which means he's got to drive all the way back to where he's just come into the pit lane. There's no access to it from there. He turns left. I can see this from the IMSA Broadcast Centre, and he's pulled up right outside the RLL paddock area. So Shea Adam will give us an update when she can on what has brought that front-running BMW in was in third position. Seeds that now to the Chevy Corvette of Tommy Milner and everyone else move up one place. Four in third, three in fourth, 67 of Richard Westbrook now up to fifth position and Giancarlo Fisichella, a fired up Fizzy, is in sixth position. Meantime, the battles in GT Daytona are worth watching as well. Well, that's always the case. Oz Negri Jr. has Pat Lindsay and Jack Hawksworth behind him. In fact, he has Jack Hawksworth and, and Patrick Lindsay now because Hawksworth just gone by Patrick Lindsay. So the 15, which went all the way down to 15th at one stage after that first corner incident for Jack Hawksworth when he spun on the outside of the horseshoe at turn one. Now back up to ninth in class and just gone by the 73 Park Place Porsche. Shea Adam with this update from BMW. 
Well, the 24 team is having a much better season than they did last year. Already got a couple podiums, but they just can't seem to buy that good luck. It's a power steering issue. John Edwards tried going around for a couple laps longer just to see if maybe he could do it for the entire day of the race. It is too severe to make it through the next two hours and 15 minutes. No, absolutely understand that. I had to drive for 55 minutes with no power steering in an MX-5 in an endurance race. And trust me, that's a small, light car. And that was a workout, a big workout. And I was absolutely bushed at the end of that. And I could barely move. In fact, I couldn't unzip my race suit because my arms were so pumped. I couldn't actually physically move them to unzip my race suit. And with the kind of downforce you're talking about on these GTLM cars, Owen, and a place that's as busy as this, driving without power steering, non-starter. Uh, it's almost impossible, and there's probably electric power steering on it, which is even worse. Uh, we had the power steering go out with the Daytona on us, but it's hydraulic, so it's a little bit different when it's electric. It almost wanna, it, it wanna, it's, the wheel wants to come out of your hands. It's yeah. gonna rip it out of your hands, basically, with that electric power steering. And this place, you're using the curb so much, and the kickback that you're gonna get, just can't do that. That's Owen Trinkler, who's tr joining us here in the IMSA Broadcast Center from CRG I Do Bor Borrow Nissan team. A winner here yesterday in the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge, their first on the season, second for Nissan, but this time a little sweeter, as this is one of Nissan's home's circuits. And at the moment, with uh, two hours and 15 minutes still to run, it's a six-second lead for the 25 BMW of Alexander Sims. Second now the, call, the 66 Ford of Joey Hand, and then Tom Milner in the Corvette is in third position in GTD. Bye-bye, Mull. Air Mull has taken off with afterburners and just blown away from a quality GT Daytona field. The 16 Change Racing Lamborghini now has nearly 10 seconds on Jerome Blakemolen in the 33 Mercedes AMG GT in second. He's only got about three quarters of a second from Jesse Cron in the blue and yellow BMW in third position. Then there's a big gap back to Madison Snow, who's up into fourth now for Paul Smith. Paul Smith, Paul Miller racing uh, and the Lamborghini back on to pit road for the 75 after that uh, after their issues that car is back on the pit road from behind the wall and now I think they came out of hmm, they might have come out the wrong exit there and he's gone straight out without going back to his pit stall which might well uh, you couldn't go back oh, yeah, yeah, well, good point uh, I, I think he's meant to go up to the other end and cycle down the pits, but I'll, I'll leave that to race control to sort out. Phew, phewy, what a start to the race. And there's barely anybody in clear air at the moment other than the two leaders in class, Jeremy. Yeah, well, yeah, the first the first two are pretty much spread out now. They're finally, they're beginning, or will be shortly, working through the, uh, the, bul the bulk of the GT Daytona field. They've only passed a couple of cars at the moment. There's number 54 and the 80. Number 50 will be next. That's uh, Cooper McNeil. And then uh, well, it's going to be another, what, uh, three, maybe four laps before they catch a, a big a gaggle of cars. And that is going to be interesting to see how Alexander Sims works his way through there. But it's been a, a dominant show so far by the BMW of the Englishman Alexander Sims and also for the Dutchman Jerome Moore in this Lamborghini. It's funny, isn't it, how Lamborghini seems to suit this track? But I think the domination we've seen today from Moore is even more than what we saw last year from the Paul Miller racing Lamborghini. Let's uh, just remind everybody of the keys to the race that we went through in the Michelin countdown to green. No prototypes out there. This is the Michelin GT Challenge. So the guys at the head of the GTLM field are racing away without having to look at their mirrors other than for their competitors. We haven't seen anybody who has had no problems getting lapped yet. So Jeremy thought maybe about uh, 20 laps or so, well, we're 16 in now. Stand by for an all green race and how much pressure does that put on the drivers? Well, we're still green now. Let's hope that that continues. Pressure on the pit lane as well as the drivers. We're coming into what have we completed? It's nearly 30 minutes uh, of racing, and we should start to see the first scheduled pit stops in around six or seven laps time for the front of the field. The 75, by the way, is back behind the wall, and as I, I think is driving up the, the to come back round through the pit lane properly. 
and use your passing zones and pick your passing zones wisely. Well, other than a bit of a schmozzle at the first corner and some um, stout uh, overtaking manoeuvre by Giancarlo Fisichella, for the moment, everybody is playing reasonably well together. Let's see how those keys to the race continue throughout the next two hours and ten minutes. Debris drivers left on the line at Oak Tree, or just on the entry to Oak Tree. We got uh, a quick sight of that earlier on. It's still sitting there. The teams have been been uh, uh, told about it. And that, of course, uh, oh, and that will come down from the, the pit wall. They will see that and be told that by race control. And uh, then they'll relay that to the drivers via the pits to car radio. Not a huge circuit here, but one or two ups or downs. No problem with getting radio all the way around the track here? No, you can actually get radio all the way around here. Last track that we raced at Road America, you had some issues there back through the Canada corner in that area. But this track, you can get radio coverage everywhere. Yeah, that's good news. And the teams will be keeping their drivers up to date with what is going on. I'd like to, uh, to bring in another guest, uh, if I may, and uh, bring in Sarah Robinson from uh, Michelin just for a moment before the pit stops kick in. Uh, welcome back to IMSA Radio, Sarah. Good to, to see you again. We heard you briefly. You were being Bebendum, who was waving the green flag, Bebendum, the Michelin man. You were being his minder down there on the grid today. That was that looked a bit a bit wild at times down there. Yeah, you know he's he tends to be one of the most popular people on the grid. It's really hard to move quickly when you're walking with a giant, you know, it's like being fluffy with guy. It's, it's like being with Jeremy. Everybody wants to talk uh, to him. You know, yeah, I mean, you know. no one sees me, so it's easy to just be a silent bodyguard. But yeah, we wanted to make sure he was ready to wave the green flag. A serious part of having you up here today. This is the Michelin GT Challenge and an announcement made today that is quite important regarding this race going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were excited to, to say that we would be doing this again next year for 2018 as well. We're really proud now to be the official tire of VIR. So being with Virginia International Raceway is a big deal for us because we test all of our, our street tires here. And, uh, you know, this is one of the, one of the best tracks uh, over here for, for testing, and we love being here. Kerrigan Smith, Connie Nyholm, the rest of the organizing uh, body here have done just a great job down uh, through the last, what, 15, 17 years since it, since it reopened. And, and this event has become a real fan favorite, huge crowd here today for the Michelin GT Challenge. Yeah, I mean, as it relates to the staff of VIR, aside from being some of the nicest people in the entire industry, they really get it. They understand what racers want. They understand what drivers want. And uh, their, their track, they take great pride in it. And that's why, you know, after the, the resurfacing, always taking great care of the track, that's paramount to, to a racer. And so, and for us as a tire company, this is one of the greatest tracks for testing because it's so good on tires and tells us so much. Your background is testing and proving street tires. So what do you learn by bringing street tires to a circuit because this is a pretty extreme circuit as well and, and probably street tires getting a, a little more abusier than anyone right. should be doing on the street at least well you know aside from just what we learn here in our competition tires with the pro teams and as well you know like the michelin slicks that we sell to, to club racers and things of that nature um, as we bring like the pilot sport family of tires to life, it's really important that we test them in this environment. Not only is it kind of the most grueling environment, but I mean, as evident when I went out to, uh, to all the corrals for Tech Talks, you know, BMW, Corvette, Porsche, all, all had these awesome turnouts. And, you know, we'd be lying to ourselves if we told our, you know, we told ourselves that those folks are not taking their cars out on track events or doing time trials, things like that. So we know that Pilot Super Sports and the new Pilot Sport 4S, that they are well prepped to live their life on track, you know, because that's that's what people want out of them. That's why they purchase those tires and put them on their cars. What's the recommendation for a 1994 Porsche Carrera, a Porsche uh, 968 Club Sport? Well, oh my is... goodness, club sport. Well, you know, we can throw some slicks on that, but you know, the wheel <laughs> the wheel sizes are getting a little harder now and now. 17s, yeah. Yeah, so 17s we can still deal with, but uh, you know, to, to everyone listening out there, 
I'm so sorry we don't have your tires in 15-inch on the Pilot Sport yeah, for I, us. I know, that's a, that's a real issue. And by the way, because I live in England, slicks aren't going to work either. Yes, yeah, you got to deal with deal with some rain out there. So the Pilot Sport for us might be a, a good option, but you might have to bump up the wheel size a little bit. 17s and 18s are coming out next year. That's a good one for me, you know, because all my cars are on 17s and 18s. So when we went with the launch list of 19s, I thought, Oh, I'm going to wait it out. We're going to have some good stuff next year. So no one despair. The, the next round of launch next year in March, we'll, we'll have you covered. Sarah, thank you very much for coming to see us. Uh, I, you're not coming to Michelin Post Race Tech. You're going to send one of your colleagues? Uh, it'll either be me or Chris Baker, our, our motorsports director for North America. Okay, get the uh, the questions coming into at IMSA Racio, hash, hashtag uh, Michelin PRT. Thank you for your support here and of the racetrack as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, everyone send the questions in. We love seeing what you guys have, have on your mind about tires. Sarah Robinson from the Michelin Tire Company joining us here live on IMSA Radio. The battles in GT Daytona are really hotting up. And behind uh, Oz Negri Jr., Daniel Morad and Cooper McNeil. And we've got the two Lexus hunting as a pair now as well and oh off the track there for one of the Lexus that's the 14 car Sage Karam as he's trying to go by Catherine Leg and Catherine oh and he's he's just brake tested it down through the S's uh, clearly wasn't happy about something and the whole of the front end of the Lexus has come up fortunately it's got a big cutout so Catherine can see uh, in the pit lane and, and the Acura is in the pit lane but the Lexus definitely brake tested the Acura coming down the hill. Now, frustration is one thing, Owen, but you can't take it out on the, the race driver behind you. No, that incident there, it looked like we just caught the tail end of it, but I don't know if Catherine left him enough room, kind of pushed him off to the right coming into Roller Coaster there, and so maybe a little retaliation there down through Roller Coaster. Shea Adam has this Continental Tire Pit Lane report from the Acura Pit. Oh, and a spot on there is a little bit more going on to that that started well early on, but that hood is seriously deranged. They're going to have to pull it off, rip it off entirely. Now, one of the Acuras ran the end of Daytona without a hood, so they know how the car performs in that situation. There's uh, a bit of denting on the nose of the car, but appears to be no suspension damage and no bigger issues for this number 93 Acura. Remember, this is the one that has won two races so far this year. It's going to be looking a little bit like Zombiezilla with pieces of carbon hanging off and a lot of black tape but they're going to do everything they can to send Catherine back out valuable points at this point in the championship and they are working very hard to get that car out that had been a good run to that point by Catherine Leg. the two Lexus had hunted her down for fourth position excuse me check that for sixth position and now Jack Hawksworth and Sage Caram are in pursuit of Christina Nielsen, the championship leader. Catherine down and away, and the bonnet, amazingly, the hood is on that car. Close quarters action, slightly too close quarters action there for GTD positions, and Catherine Lake drops down to 13th in class, Jeremy. Yeah, that was very strange, and uh, certainly the number 14, Lexus Sage Karen, he'd been uh, uh, chasing Christina Nielsen. Catherine Lake was right behind him, and then Jack Hawksworth had caught up to the whole group. Well, Jack was a big winner out of that, because he's all of a sudden uh, jumped up uh, two places. Also, now uh, he's going to, he lost a little bit of ground to Christina, so he's going to have to make that up again. Let's have a replay of what happened. Well, there was a little bit of the Acura easing slightly to the right as the 14 was trying to go through on the last part of the straight. Oh, well, uh, right, okay, hang on. There was a block before that by Sage Karam. So Karam blocks Catherine Leg. Catherine then eases over to the middle of the road and there doesn't was, there was a car with that. doesn't There's hit. Wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, and then Sage Karam just stands it up in the Twice. That's bizarre. Yeah, yeah that's you'd, that's going to get a drive through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think he'd be yeah back I think his brain gas, fell out of gear. Is what happened there. Yeah. Catherine had the run on him, yeah. and Sage Sage moves over. There's yeah. two touches. She drove him. He drove her off the road. Yeah. And she, then Catherine moves back to the yeah, middle to get a position. The car with, just about. And Sage swerves over to the right, puts two continental ties on the dirt. Yeah, Jack maintains Hawksworth. a position yes. by braking late, good. But then yeah. break, stands on the brakes coming out of the corner. Jack Holtz goes through, and he is, as Jeremy said, the big winner there. Catherine Lake, the big loser. No doubt that will be being looked at by the race control officials just off to our right. 
Yeah, uh, do you know what? It's, it's like any sport, though, isn't it? It's the same as in soccer. If you get fouled in soccer, you wait for the referee to make the decision. You yeah. don't take uh, the offence into your own hands and retaliate. And retaliation, for me, is something... That's a loss of control. Yes. And I don't like to see that in any sport, and particularly not at 150 miles an hour. No, and I can tell you it's going to be... Yeah, I tell you he's going to be upset by that. And that'll be, uh, that'll be Paul Genalosi. He won't, he won't be uh, at all impressed by that. No, too early on in this race, Jeremy. I mean, we're 45 minutes in, two hours if, to go. If it's the last lap, different steel, different deal. But I mean, we're 40, you know, 45 minutes in here. You got to get, you got to get the car to your co-driver. Yeah. You know, we're not in the second half of this race yet. That speaks a man who normally drives second. <laughs> you see? Yeah. That's a, come on, guys. Yeah. yeah well, I just wonder what Sage's co-driver is thinking when he watches. Oh, I've got to get a bent car. Oh. Let's uh, go down to the pit lane. Here's some better news if you're a BMW fan. Share, Adam. The number 24 has been repaired. The power steering fixed, and uh, John Edwards still behind the wheel as uh, he has done minimum drive time. It's only 10 minutes in the GTLM category, but they're going to put four new Michelins on him, give him a lot more fuel, and uh, although they are basically out of it in this one, if anybody else falls out, they can move up a position or two. And as... Uh, John Edwards said on the grid, they're playing tail gunner for the 25 if they have to. Well, now they have to. Yeah, yeah. true enough. Boy, how, how many times has that happened to the number 24 car in the last couple of years? It's been bizarre. He's just gone past us and back into the race, and he did indeed come down from my left, just come all the way down. The mechanics have completed the service and walk out from, the, from underneath the BMW team RLL awning. Still waiting to find out who'll be running the BMW M8, and it will be the M8 here in the IMSA competition next year. BMW making everybody wait at the moment. GT Daytona, Jerome Mull, if you want someone to go fast in a GTD car around the VIR circuit, uh, rent yourself a Netherlands driver called Jerome. Mull and Blake Mullen out ahead of the field. 14 seconds now, uh, Mull at the head of the field. Bleak and Morland, no slouch, of course. He's got his hands full of Jesse Kron in the Turner BMW, and they've got traffic ahead. That's Andrew Davis, who's dropped to the back of the GT Daytona field, having had that puncture earlier on, mm. or at least tyre issue. Uh, and talking of uh, bouncing back from an earlier issue, uh, Giancarlo Fizzi Keller, over the last several laps, has closed right up onto the tail of uh, Richard Westbrook and, uh, and the two Corvettes as well. He was... Only oh, seven or eight laps ago, he was four, four seconds behind. It was five seconds before that. Uh, so he's made up a lot of ground. Uh, you make up at least three or four tenths of a second worth a lap, if not more than that. So Fizzy Keller right with now Richard Westbrook. Let's see if he can make a pass, however. He's, uh, he's tried a couple of times to pass. It's awfully, it is awfully difficult to overtake around here when they're evenly matched cars. And these are certainly even. Let's go down to Shea Adam, who is in the pit lane for this Continental Tire uh, report. The 93 car coming back in, in fact, is back into the pit lane with Catherine Legg after uh, that touch, uh, touch, and touch moment uh, on the back straight and the roller coaster. It is. The front wheels have been removed from that car as the mechanics went to work on it on the pit lane, trying to get everything fixed as quickly as they could. Now they've decided to put the wheels back on. They're very cognizant that the car in front of them, the 912, is coming into pit ASAP. And at the top of the roller coaster, the 28 Porsche is well off the road. And this might bring a green, a, a yellow flag. Daniel Morad was in 10th position and immediately into the pit lane, Richard Westbrook. He might be just on the right side of a yellow flag here if it comes. Waiting to see if the 28 car can get turned around. Lauren Van Tuer coming into the pit lane as well. Morad's going again. We're not going to get full course yellow. Shea Adam is with the GTLM cars. 9-12, it is Jimmy Bruni time. Lawrence Vantor hops out of that car and Richard Westbrook out of the number 67. Fuel and tires for both of those cars. The other Porsche, meanwhile, has come to a stop on its marks. And 2015 overall winner of this race, Patrick Pile, is taking up his duties behind the wheel. The Ford has refired, was the first one to stop in its pit box. The fueling's still going on, though, for the 67. Ford leaves. The 912 is cleared to go. Now Jimmy Bruni gets things moving, and the 911 still here getting fuel. And an incident for the other Acura, the 86 car, Oz Negri Jr., coming through turn 
two and three and got a little dink from Jan Magnussen in the three car as he was going up the inside. Meantime, the Allegra Motorsport Porsche has regained the track and he was overtaking that 86 car into the roller coaster when he just ran long in the middle part of it and went off. Actually made quite substantial contact with the wall on the outside of the roller coaster, as did Oz Negri on the outside of turn uh, number three. Uh, stop and 60 seconds for the number 14 of Sage Karam. Stop and 60 seconds. Avoidable risk is what has, that has been turned. The three and 86 already under review from race control. Right, not hearing anybody arguing with that one here. No, I, I think good call there on the, on the 14 there. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's uncalled for. He's not, he doesn't know where to go to serve his penalty, Shea Adam. The number 14 stopped where the IMSA timing line is. Yeah, as you can hear in the background, there's a massive burnout as he realized he was stopped in the wrong spot. So it's actually going to be about a stop plus 70 because he spent 10 seconds in the wrong pit box. He has rectified that and now made it down to the penalty box where he is sitting. And as you can hear from the tire squeal, not a happy bunny. Shea Adam with that report from the pit lane. We're live trackside. IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together as Catherine Legg actually is just rolling out again in the 93 Acura. That was the car that was damaged in that incident for which Sage Karam is serving the penalty right now. Let's take a breath for a moment. Alexander Sims leads the motor race by an impressive 17 seconds from Joy Hand in the 66 Chip Ganassi Racing Car in second. Corvette Racing, 1.4 seconds further back in third with Tommy Milner, then Jan Magnussen, another second further back, then another second further back, Giancarlo Fisichella in fifth in the 62 Ferrari. Sage Karam does another burnout just off to our right and heads back onto the circuit. In GTD, it's another impressive drive by Jerome Mull in the Lamborghini from Change Racing, that's the 16 car. His lead has come down a little bit, but not much. It's still 15, 16 seconds. And he's now got Jimmy Bruni between, uh, uh, between himself and uh, Jerome Blakemola, because Bruni, of course, is just out on the circuit having his first run in the race because the 912 has made its first stop. Uh, second, Blakemola in the 33 Mercedes and GTT. Those are the ones with the green end plates, mirrors, and positional numbers. Third, Jesse Kron is still tied with a very short bungee cord onto the back of Blake and Morland. Now, further down, Christina Nielsen with Jack Hawksworth right in her wheel tracks at the moment as Jimmy Bruni on the circuit for Porsche. The first time, of course, that Jimmy Bruni's been in the same race as a Ferrari since he changed sides and that Ferrari is right up behind Jan Magnussen. Yeah, that's a good little battle. I'll tell you what, those two, or, or Tommy Milner and Mag and uh, Tommy Milner at least, has closed up on uh, Joey Hand over the last few laps. This is that Christina oh. being elbowed out wide at Oatry. That's going to give Jack Hawks with an opportunity to make another pass. He's come to the back of the field up to fifth place now. Smart move by Christina Nielsen. She's thinking championship right now. She's thinking hand the car over to Alessandro Balzan in one piece. Exactly what you were talking about. Oli. No, that's what you have to do. The starting drivers, they need to give the, the finishing driver a car that's got the alignment still there, all the aero pieces on it, so the, the finishing driver can go try to win the race or do the best result for the car. Uh, Jeremy, my question to you now is you're kind of keeping track of the stats here. The early pit stops for the 67 and the 911 there, um, what's that going to do with their fuel strategy Well, now? I think they're fine. I think they can make it. They'll need one more stop to, for the end of the race, but I think they'll be good to go from there. I think that's yeah. probably why we saw all three cars uh, onto pit lanes, including both of the Porsches. Uh, so uh, I suppose both of them came in perhaps, but they, they, they don't need to come in just yet. But I think from the end, they can get there comfortably on one more pit stop. Leader will be in the pits for its first scheduled stop in a moment. By the way, talking about uh, Giancarlo Fisic, uh, excuse me, about Jimmy Bruni in the 912 car. Listening to Midweek Motorsport on Wednesday over on RadioLeMond.com at 8 o'clock UK time. That's uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon where we are now in Virginia. A very illuminating interview, part one of two that we're going to be doing with Jimmy Bruni as, uh, as long ones. 
uh, in our long one series. Jimmy talking about his early career and an uh, alternative career that almost happened for him that you simply won't believe. That's Wednesday, 8 o'clock UK, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jimmy Bruni uh, talking on the long one on Midweek Motorsport over on RadioLamont.com this Wednesday night. Let's go back down to the pit lane for an update from Shea Adam on Acura with his Continental Tire Report. The number 86 Acura spent a couple of laps on the pit lane as they repaired the left rear of that car and the number 93, Catherine Lake still behind the wheel, has just gone behind the wall. The number 15 illuminated on the side of the door. She didn't actually have enough lock in the steering wheel to make it all the way around, so now she's waiting for her crew to catch up to her to help her get pushed back to the garage. Meanwhile, Alexander Sims comes to a stop, hits his mark perfectly. The BMW mechanics put a new Michelin this is scrubbed with rubber on the car. It is not shiny and new in uh, perfectly conditions. Bill Oberlin is getting his chance to drive, though. Three-time winner of IMSA competition at Virginia International Raceway. So Bill Oberlin knows how to make a BMW go fast around this place. We also have the 63 Scuderia Course Ferrari in the pit lane. Oberlin just waiting on fuel refires the car. Christina Nielsen will be getting out of that. Alessandro Balzon getting in. The 48 has come in, and Madison Snow, the winner from last year in pole sitter, has handed over to Brian Sellers and we do have a Lexus on the pit lane it's a little bit too much further down for me to be able to tell what the number is on that one it's the 14 thank you John for saying that in my ears and uh, we've got Corvette up on the wall Ford up on the wall spare drivers for each up on the wall Trent Hinman about to make his debut in the GTD category he has raced the PC before he's getting ready to take over for your own Blake Mullen and pretty much everybody else is on the pit wall now John <laughs> by me finishing that sentence she had it with the comprehensive Continental Tire pit lane report. Joey Hans' lead is now down to 2.2 seconds because he has been scored as the leader in that Chip Ganassi Racing number 66 with the 25 out of the pit lane, rejoining in fifth position. And Shea Adam, we've already seen Catherine Legg go behind the wall, and this is disaster in the last couple of minutes for Michael Shank Racing. Jeff Siegel just went to join her in the uh, red Acura, and then because they are different con con colors, I'll try that again, I know that there are two different cars, but the top three in GTD are in the pit lane right now. The 16 chain racing Lamborghini still on its mark. They're doing fuel. I did not see a driver change going on for that. I might have missed it, though. I do admit. Turner Motorsports in the pit lane. Still Jesse Crumb behind the wheel. And for the 33, your own Bleak Mullen has gotten out. Trent Hidman has been installed in that. They are doing four tires in fuel. We have the 66 Ford, the pole sitting GTLM car getting new Michelin tires. Then came the three. That would be the Corvette racing entry. It is a driver change for both the 66 and the 3. So Dirk Mueller getting into the 66. Antonio Garcia to the 3. The 96 goes back out. The BMW with a really good stop for that GTD car. Uh, meanwhile, the 33 just now left. So that should mean that the 96 should get the lead because the 16 uh, no, just got out ahead of it. Just got out ahead yeah, of it. Yeah, it did. You couldn't have seen that from where you were, Shit. But, uh, the 16 Lamborghini still with Jerome Mull on the timing screen has got out and is still in the lead of GT Daytona. That's what the timing screen tells me. I'll give it a lap or so to settle down. But I do believe that Jesse Kron staying aboard the 96 BMW has jumped the 33 Mercedes-Benz and gone up into second place. The 33 now with Trent Hinman on board uh, is in third position. Cooper McNeil in the 50 mm. Porsche. And yes, it is a Porsche. We uh, sure did cause a bit of a Twitter meltdown earlier on by tweeting a picture of the 50 car which was a Mercedes, because it was. They have both cars here this weekend, and they were wheeling it around the paddock. Don't know if they were doing that just to um, antagonise people or wind them up, I'm not sure. But it caused a Twitter storm. Shea Adam, back in the pit lane. Yep, we just have the Reese Ferrari pit board dangling down, as well as the number four Corvette has come onto the pit lane. Oliver Gavin on the wall for the four, and Tony Vlander time in the number 62. These are our cars coming in from first and second, respectively, in class. The four was ahead of the 62, so numerical order was correct. Giancarlo Fisichella already out. And for the Reese Competizione guys, this is a chance to show off their pit 
non-stop practice that they have been doing, trying to perfect their skills to beat the Corvette Racing guys because everybody tries to beat the Corvette Racing guys. The uh, four chains, the driver change is already done. The door has been shut. All four new Michelin tires put on. Just waiting on fuel for both of the cars now as who's going to get it first? The Ferrari does have a slower fuel rate, but they managed to leave their pit box first. Of course, their pit box is much closer toward pit in than the Corvette. Corvette fueling rate still in. Now it comes out. Ferrari beats Corvette. Wow, that is impressive. They put less fuel in the Ferrari because it's got a smaller tank, but it does flow at a slower rate. That sounds odd, doesn't it? But that's part of the balance of performance that IMSA applies to try and make the racing closer. And the 62 is ahead of the Ford of Dirk Muller. So that is an important game for racing. That's a huge pit stop for the 62 car having been at the sharp end of the field early on. Problems on the opening laps with Giancarlo Fisichella. He fought back robustly, perhaps too robustly. No action so far. By the way, no action 86 and 3 for that uh, earlier incident at turn number 3. And I'm um, indebted to Lee Driggers for passing that on uh, to me. So, Vlander, I reckon when we come round, Bill Oberlin will be leading and leading comfortably in the 25 BMW but it'll be the 62 Ferrari in second place. Yeah. And that's what we were talking about in the keys to the race, about pressure for everybody, not just the drivers. Owen, when you've got a pit crew who can make up ground for you and make you up a couple of places, that's a good team to be in. Oh, that's awesome. We made up some spots yesterday in our pit stop, but the 62 V-Lander came out the opening. I mean, the 66 car was on warm tires, as we saw going down in turn one. Good couple of corners there. Now he's pulled a gap on them. And this yeah, is a great return for Racy, isn't it? Uh, magnificent. And yeah, we talked about you right earlier on, and I, I said I don't think it was going to be too much of a handicap because Sims does his homework in terms of how long the pit stops will take. That uh, Ferrari is very frugal in its fuel consumption, but it was a great stop, a great in lap, and uh, that Tony Vlander. Now we saw how quick he was yesterday and he is up to pace, but it was a really good stop by that team. I mean, they came in, uh, he was behind both of the Corvettes when he, uh, before the Corvettes came on, well, actually, the, the, excuse, let me start again. He was behind both of the Corvettes. The number three came in one lap earlier than the number four and the 62 Ferrari, but the 62 cars vaulted both of them and that four GT. That, that was some great laps there, in lap and out lap, yeah. like you said there, Jeremy. On cold tires, now he's got a couple car length gap on the 66 here. That's that's awesome stuff. Are uh, you listening to IMSA Radio? Paired up with IMSA TV, for those of you who are so equipped around the world, of course, via the IMSA app and uh, the player at Radio Le Mans.com. Also on XM205, Sirius 118. Uh, for those of you who have those subscriptions and here at the track on 89.9 FM. The voices in the booth are that of Jeremy Shaw. Owen Trinkler is joining us today from CRG I Do Borrow and the Nissan Altima team. Shea Adam, as usual, our Continental Tire, pit lane, eyes, ears and more importantly, feet. And I'm John Hindorf. Welcome. I hope you're enjoying this so far. It's been an absolute cracker. We're just on the hour mark and the... Lead is in the hands of BMW with Bill Oberlin. How many times have I said that down through the years here mm. in North America? Uh, uh, and the gap now from first to second is 14.4 seconds. Well, before the round of pit stops, number 25 car had almost 20 seconds over number 66 Ford. So that shows you how much ground the Ferrari has made up. Uh, BMW number 24 going past one of the GT Le Mans Porsches. It's not for position because they are laps down. John Edwards gets one of them back. But he's on his 23rd lap, and the leaders are on their 34th. And even my basic arithmetic uh, can tell you that that's an 11 lap difference. That's how long that car was behind the wall with power steering issues. Have a close look if you're here at the track, or have access to pictures at the front right hand side of Tony V. Landers' Reese Ferrari. Looks to be something dragging the ground, maybe. As he was going through there might have been a, an issue that uh, occurred when Fisichella went off at turn 10 in the early part of the race. In the 16 at the moment, uh, Shea Adam might be able to answer this. I'm still scoring that as Javon Mull. Did he stay in the car, Shea? He did. They did not do a driver change. It was fuel, and I don't even think they did tyres. I didn't see them do tyres, at least. Thank you very much indeed, Shea Adam. 
Well, this has been a great race so far and continues to be so. 48 won the race last year. Brian Sellers now in behind one of the AMG GTs. And right behind him, he's got Jack Hawksworth. So is that Trent Hinman right ahead of him? I don't think it is. That's the Lone Star car, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. The number 96 BMW vaulted the number 33 Mercedes at that round of pit stops. He's come out well in front. Yeah. But I mean, well in front. Brian Sellers has got the uh, Jack Hawks with his not right behind him. That's Robert Alon, who again, who is uh, off the pace by a lap or two. So Sellers has gone through past the back markers. And now the 48 car then has an 18 second deficit to Trent Hinman, who is in that 33 car. Yes. Trent called into that car uh, late on in the week because Ben Keating, he of their fantastic speaking voice, uh, had to leave to go and deal with things down in Texas. Uh, for those of you who haven't been watching the news, oh my goodness me, side by side contact again yeah. at turn three, and this time, that's the 67 Ooh. car, Brian Briscoe. Didn't like that, clearly. Trying to get a little bit physical with the old hip check on Ollie Gavin. Now, Ollie has driven Australian V8 supercars, so he's not going to be intimidated by that, and he knows that he can, with a car with fenders, with uh, wheel arches, he can lean back when people want to try and get aggressive with them. And Ollie Gavin continues then to hold on to fifth position. Yeah, just finished the Ben Keating. Uh, story. He left to go and attend to uh, matters uh, down in uh, Texas. Uh, for those of you uh, outside of the US who might not be keeping up with events, extreme weather, extreme rain uh, down in. And the stickers on the cars this weekend say Texas strong. I know that's a hashtag that's being used as well. Uh, our best thoughts uh, going to everyone in that part of the world. And Ben, if uh, I'm sure he's got better things to do to be watching or listening this, but. Uh, we're thinking about you and all of our friends down there in Texas and indeed everybody down there in the path of Hurricane Harvey. An hour and 40 minutes still to go. And this has been a cracker. Physical, exciting. This is what happens when you get green flag racing. Nobody's waiting for the yellow flags, Owen. They want to make their move and they want to make it now. No, you've got to do it now. I mean, but you got to keep the car intact for the end of the run here towards the end of the race. But we thought this might happen, you know, this, the, the practices, basically no red flags or anything, so we thought that this race could go, you know, green flag all the way. Number 80 car back in and through the pits for a drive through, had the wheels spinning uh, on the jacks, that's a no-no. That, I think, has just been served, that car's just out of the... Which car is that? That is 8 zero car. Yes, OK. Max yeah. Skeen uh, has just been through the pit lane. I may have misspoken earlier on, uh, Tony Veland, I haven't seen him for a, a while. I'm going to try and see him when he comes past us again here. I think I said front right. Um, I was reversing that from a picture that I saw. I think it's the front left that's dragging uh, on the ground of the 62 car. And thanks to Marshall Pruitt for pointing that out. Marshall from Racer Magazine seems to be omnipotent. He was mentioned in the IndyCar uh, commentary on NBC last night as well. He's across so many bits of the sport, it's scary. I think there are actually seven of them. Uh, and uh, uh, Fizzy's actually lost a couple of seconds relative to the race leader over the last uh, one, two, three laps as well. It was 14.4 yes, seconds was. after the pit stops, now 16 and a half And seconds. he's got Dirk Muller right in his wheel tracks too. Mid-engine cars, but with very different philosophies. And, oh, hello, we've got Ferrari versus Ford again. We're not at Le Mans, we're in Virginia, but I'll take a little bit of that. Bit of historical needle between these two classic brands in GT racing and Muller jinks to the right, which is the inside for the right-handed turn one and two, the horseshoe. Now, what, what did she tell she what did she say in regards to that number 16 pit stop by Jerome Muller? He, he thought, didn't change tyres. She thought it was fuel only. Fuel only, okay, right. Well, the, the gap uh, since around the pit stops, during that round of pit stops, we already talked about the fact number 96 turning most what BMW has got ahead of uh, now Trent Hinman aboard number 33 
at Riley Motorsports uh, Mercedes. And that gap has come down from 11 and a half seconds to nine and a half seconds. Uh, Jesse Throne is closing in now. He's just set that car's fastest lap of the race, having taken over. Did he take over? Yes, yes he did. The, f the, the first. Uh, no, yes, he no, didn't. He Sorry. Didn't. Yes, yes, he, he didn't. didn't. The front. Right. Yes, he didn't. Correct. Correct. Uh, it, we, we had. Uh, remember, we had Yessi, Jerome, uh, and Jerome, Jerome, and Yessi. Now yes. we've got uh, uh, Jerome, Yessi, and Trent. The 33 car was the only car that changed drivers mm. in that pit stop side. Interesting. So, uh, but but the, the the BMW, my point, is closing in now on uh, that Lamborghini. Uh oh, we'll turn keep an eye three, on that. 911. Ooh, Patrick Peel. It. Well, he's not had the best of weekends for the former champion in the category. He's been off the road at Oak Tree, and now again, this is uh, unusual for Patrick Peel. It. Very good golfer and fan of classic cars. He's off in the scenery and does the big jump on the brakes to try and clear the air duct at the front of the car. We saw that being employed earlier in the uh, weekend with uh, some success by... It was Tommy Milner who, was, who yeah. did that in the Corvette, wasn't it? It was Tommy, yeah, coming out of turn three there. He stopped before he went into turn four and just slammed on the brakes to a complete stop and all the grass came off the radiator there. Remember Earl Bamber doing something similar in the Porsche last year. If uh, reports are to be believed, Earl Bamber and fellow LMP1 Le Mans winning Porsche driver Nick Tandy joining the Porsche GT team at Petit Le Mans later in the IMSA racing year, the finale of our IMSA racing season at Road Atlanta. Good to have those two back, if that is two. 95% certain that that's going to happen, said a Porsche spokesperson. And now Vlander up in behind Jesse Krohn. And he's got Dirk Muller right behind him, so that's GTD second place. And then GT Le Mans, an overall second place, and overall third place, Dirk Muller in the 66, the red, white, blue Ford GT right in behind him. Man, that BMW is quick in a straight line, Owen. No, that's what I heard. I talked to a couple of Andrew Davis this morning. He said the BMW and the Lexus, they have got the legs on the straightaway here. And we saw in the break zone, only one car could get by here. Separates them a little bit here. That was at the top of the hill at the roller coaster, and that GT Daytona BMW not running in the same class as the Vlander Ferrari. And now the Ford will have to try and power through. And that BMW is making a hole in the air. He's having to use the draft here to get up underneath. Now, he should have the advantage with a little bit later braking with the aero. He's not, you know. Yes, he, yes, he crone holding on around the outside. A bit naughty there, but making his point. My goodness me, that car is quick. Yeah, but V-Lander wanted that. We saw in South Bend, he dropped just a little bit of the right front tire. V-Lander did. Now we got an issue here with the 73. He's uh, been out mowing some grass there. And that's York Bergmeister behind the wheel. He's up at the oak tree turn. And has he got a tire going down as well? It seems to be, yes, he has left rear tire. Now again, can't tell you whether that is cause or effect. It's the left rear round here, Owen, that takes the pounding though, because you're leaning on that tire through all the quick corners. You are, instead, down in Hogpen is the biggest issue. When you could drop down into 17 there and the car compresses down there. Uh, like I said earlier in the show, I talked to some people at the Continental and they said, they're just running too much camber yeah. in the left rear. They just can't do that yeah. and that's what's causing the problem. There. Yeah, and running lower pressures as well so on occasion. Don't know, I'm not suggesting they're doing that now, but that certainly has been a problem. And I was actually talking to those guys yesterday to Jord Bergmeister, and they had, a, they had a, a puncture yesterday in that car. They had a puncture also at Road America. They were lucky there because they were able to make their pit stop uh, and without losing too much ground uh, and still came away with a second place finish. They actually worked out in their favour, uh, coincidentally. But uh, there, there are a lot of punctures, particularly on that car, it seems. And the tyre companies, both Continental and Michelin, will issue a set of parameters for their tyres in terms of starting pressures, camber angles, uh, and how long they think the tyres will run on a stint. And although they're only advisory, it's not smart to try and uh, take an advantage there because the guys who are putting that uh, information out know the tyres very, very well, having made them. Now, think back a couple of... Well, it seems like a couple of minutes ago. It's probably about 20 minutes ago now when Christina Nielsen was ceding the position of fifth in GTT to Jack Hawksworth's uh, number 15 Lexus. Well, Alessandro Balzan is behind the wheel of the 63 car and has just dragged back 
past that car. No, in actual fact, that's the number 14 oh, car. sorry. Yeah, the number 15 ah, car Robert has actually Alon. pulled yes. away sorry. from last because Alon was holding up Balzan for four or five laps, so it's a good point there, John. Uh, but it, he, he'd held up Balzan. Now, now uh, Alessandro's found a way past. And that's a 7.3 seconds gap. Let's uh, see if we can Cause, uh, yeah, cause bring that down. Balzan was right four laps ago. He was right, right with the number 15 car. Now, yes. he's, as you say, seven seconds behind him. Yes, my apologies. Those two Lexus are very similar. Yeah, they are. And uh, with the green wing mirrors and wing end plates signifying, of course, that they are the GT. D category. Let's go for a Continental Tire pit lane update. Hey, Shea Adam. A rather unpleasant smell coming from the 73 Park Place Porsche, both of the Continental Tire that it, it really is just not a pleasant smell when a rubber tire goes down, but worse, grass that has come into the radiator and then started burning. We have both going on right now for 73. They uh, cleaned out the front end of the Porsche and put in four new tires on. Not expecting to come back in that soon, but now they've got to uh, play to a different strategy. And now it's official, by the way, both cars for Michael Shank Racing, both the 86 and the 93, for the second consecutive race will DNF. Oh, sorry to hear that. Michael will not be happy at all. Uh, Acura with such a good start to their debut season here in the IMSA competition. Looks like that Ferrari's been banged up a little bit at the at rear as well. I'll take another close look at it when it comes by me, but the right rear light cluster. Now, I know that's the area where the uh, airline sometimes goes in, but is that right rear uh, uh, cluster gone? No, it's just the way that it's, it's actually left open now. I've just realised that it looks the same on both sides. A great rear guard action at the minute by Tony Vlander on Dirk Muller. What that's allowing to happen, though, Jeremy, is Antonio Garcia and a little bit further back, but Oli Gallon. But Tonio Garcia in the number three Corvette is about to make that a three-way scrap for second position. Yeah, that battle has really been heating up, hasn't it, between number 62 uh, Ferrari and number 66 Ford. And as you say, number three car isn't far behind. Number four car is not far behind here either. Uh, although ooh, it's actually four and a half seconds now, it, it's, it, that's, that's grown over the last four or five laps. So number three, Carl Garcia pulling away from Gavin, but the gap between first, yeah, and Garcia just said his best lap of the race, 42-0. The uh, gap at the front of the field, how, now, however, now however, 19 seconds. Yeah, and Oops. Ford going off the circuit a couple of laps ago, coming out of Oak Tree. It's a tiny, tiny error again, just touching the inside kerb at turn 12. And, he, and again, he's done damage there. And that was Muller, I think. Yes, it is. It is that uh, 66 car. And he's done damage to the, the front splitter on the left-hand side. Bit of carbon or something flapping up on the, from the underside of that car. Now, you might say, well, it's hardly anything. These cars, Owen, are honed to perfection in terms of their aerodynamic performance, and particularly the Ford, uh, in point of fact. That car is designed with the whole car as an, an, aerodynamic, uh, an aerodynamic device, and you don't want to be pulling things off from underneath or changing the wing angle or anything like that. Yeah, especially around this place, all the high-speed corners that you got as we're coming up to the... The, the yes is here. And what happens there on the oak tree there, if you just take too much curb, it almost launches you off a car width out to the outside. That looks like what happened there. It really elevates up if you hit that apex curb too much there. So coming down under 90 minutes remaining. And what a battle this has been so far. The Michelin GT Challenge living up to its top billing in terms of sports car racing and GT racing. Tonio Garcia now has his two victims in sight. That's how he'll see it. And there's a there's a real surge of adrenaline, isn't there, Owen, when you can see the cars in front of you getting a little larger. Garcia's coming. And what's getting ready to happen here, we're catching the GTD leader in this battle too. The V-Lander's already flashing the lights. So this is gonna get interesting here because the 16 cars lead in GTD and this battle's coming to him. Stevenson, Audi in the pit lane, Shea Adam will keep an eye on that big amount of inside curb at 17 taken by Dirk Muller. And Jerome Bull has got these two GT LM cars coming at the pit lane, uh, at the pit straight, excuse me. I don't think they're going to be close enough to go down the inside into the first corner. You know, Dirk Muller realises that Garcia is coming and he needs to get by Vlander. I think he thinks he's been 
held up. He's probably right at the moment. Veilander's pace just a tick or two of the clock away from what we've seen from that Ferrari. Now, what will Mull do here? Great use of the blue flag from the Marshalls station, the flagger station on driver's right. Mull holds his line. That's exactly what you're told to do. Now, going up the hill here, there's really only one line. These guys are going to have to be patient. Tony Veilander is under pressure. He can't get through here. He's moving around, trying to defend from the Ford. And now the Corvette's right there as well into Oak Tree. Got to get up the inside into Oak Tree. And Mull just needs to pull to the left and lift a tiny little bit. Hasn't done it. He's still holding on. Now, we know that Lamborghini is very quick if he gets a good exit out of Oak Tree. And he has. Pulls half a car length or more out of the GTLM cars. So, Vlander sits in the draft, can barely see the Ferrari. Now pulls out two drivers left, and the Ford's gone with him. He can't drag past him. He hasn't got the ponies. No, he doesn't. That He's Lamborghini... really had to push uh, really uh, hard uh, there. And Muller's left it off there, because that, that Lamborghini is ridiculously fast on the straights. I mean, it really quick. You look at the speed charts, it's... it's... Basically, it's the same as, as we saw then, as most of the GTD, uh, GTLM cars. I reckon Mull actually lifted off there and let right. them go through because he, he knows breathed. he's got a good lead. And I talked about the fact that gap had come down from, uh, what was it, uh, 11 seconds to 9 or so. Well, it's now stretched out again to 14 seconds that, that Mull has over Krohn. We're getting excited about... Uh, cars passing GTD cars, well that's extraordinary to me. Let's not forget Tony Villander's only in second. Bill Oberlin is 23 seconds up the road and well out of all these issues at the moment. He can much more pick and choose his passing places. One of our keys to the race, we talked about the Michelin countdown uh, to green. We have been all green to this point. We've got an hour and 25 minutes to go. Mull leads by 12.2 seconds from Jesse Krohn in the 96 BMW, then Trent Hinman in third position. The Allegra Motorsports car going slowly in the early part of the lap, and I think that's another left rear tyre problem. As BMW number 25, our leader, is putting a lap on Patrick Pele, mm. the 911 car. Now, that is a significant moment. It is. It's, uh, it's happened a lot quicker than I thought it was going to do yeah. as well. Patrick's had a little off, so that is putting further back into the clutches of the leader, but just has not had the pace. The two Porsches lapping in the 42s for the most part. No, Everybody I, else in the 41 and a half. I, I made a mental note about that, but I wasn't expecting to be talking about it uh, for another couple of laps. <laughs> <laughs> It's Jeremy Shaw and Owen Trinklet with me, John Hindoff, in the IMSA Broadcast Centre, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for being with us. Shea Adam is our Continental Tire pit lane reporter at IMSA Radio if you want to get in touch with us. And don't forget, coming at the end of the race, Michelin post-race tech, your observations, questions from the whole of the weekend, not just necessarily the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. And use the hashtag MichelinPRT and send that to at IMSA Radio. Well, that's uh, still a little while away. The chequered flag is the end of the race, but we'll be the start of the discussion here on IMSA Radio with Michelin Post Race Tech. So, everybody has done a scheduled pit stop. 9-11, even struggling to get past the 54 of Colin Brown in 10th position in GTD, but get past, he does coming out of Oak Tree. Porsche still gets my vote for the best sounding car. On the, I, I do like a big rumbling V8, but there's something about that howling flat six with that new exhaust that they have had since Le Mans that uh, just really makes my senses a little sharper. Battle for second position has not quietened down at all, although Garcia has dropped back just a tiny bit. The bright red 62 of Tony Vlander heading down the back straight at the moment with Dirk Muller dragging up closer, closer to him, goes to the left-hand side. That's the side that you want to go to for that kink. But we've seen some success from drivers going what looks to be initially the long way around, Owen, and going to the right-hand side. If you can get side-by-side side through that little left-hand kink, then that puts you in a good spot to get to the apex of the right-hander at the roller coaster first. No, that's what you want to do. If you get too far to the outside, it's actually off camber, and it'll send you down the hill there. So you want to make sure if you can get, you know, fake left and maybe come back right, 
uh, maybe kind of he's showing here he's down in turn one. He keeps faking like he's going to make a move there. He's he's going to set him up here in a couple laps. He, the Ford is definitely quicker. He got kind of separated there with some lap traffic, but he's run up back down. Uh, Shea Adam just passing some information on for you, Jeremy. Uh, Jerome Mull did take tyres at his stop, so that was tyres and fuel for the 16 car. It was just a very, very quick stop from Change Racing. They've been on point all weekend. I think they want that one. I really do. Home track for them too. For yes, the change racing. indeed. So, yes. And uh, and she will have to find out as we get in this last pit stop that coming up that who's going on scuffed tires. I talked to a couple teams this morning for scuffing tires uh, because of the track temp and all the grip that's here in the surface here this weekend. Yeah, what difference does that make? We hear people talking about that. When you say scuffing the tires, that's just taking the sheen off them. What difference does that make? And, and how do you feel that as a driver? The biggest thing that it helps you do, because when you get new tires, you feel like you're king, man. You're ready to go out there and drive and, and go fast and put a qualifying lap down. What happens, though, if you do that with a new tire, you're going to overheat the tire. And once you do that, we haven't had a caution. And so under green flag running, you're never going to be able to cool that tire down quick enough. And so once you get it hot, it's tough to get that, that tire back underneath you. So when, if you go out and just run a couple laps, uh, kind of get the mold release off, as I like to call, and get the tire heated up and get everything uh, looking good on the tire, then, then you can go pound on it pretty good during the run, and you're not going to overheat the tire. You may not have the quick lap, but you're looking for longevity, which we're finding here today, that you got good grip in the track, and we've had green flag the whole time here. You realize now if we go yellow, it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> So the hashtag becomes blame Owen. Blame me for being yeah. up here in the boot now. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you, listen, you, you stand here, you take responsibility. That's that's the way it goes. Under an hour and 20 minutes to go. Bill Oberlin leads for Rahal, Letterman, Lanigan and for BMW. 23 seconds is the gap from Tony Vlander in second place in the Ferrari. And then it's very tight indeed. The 62 car back in competition for EC Competizione this weekend. And the final time that this chassis will be campaigned this season uh, by the Houston-based team. They are going back to their Le Mans car, which is back in the US and repaired. And we'll see that at Master Race Laguna Sega and at the season finale at Road Atlanta, Petit Le Mans. Dirk Muller in third position is the best place of the Ford GTs. The Chip Canassi racing driver just half a second behind the Scarlet Ferrari. Antonio Garcia, about a second and a half further back in the first of two bright yellow Chevy Corvettes. And again, Muller going off the circuit, coming out of Oak Tree, not doing his course any good there. Not only does he lose ground, but he dirties up the left side, Michelin tyres. Oli Gavin is another three seconds back from his teammate. That's the number four Corvette, and that's fifth position. And he now is nearly 30 seconds behind the race leader. Just over 31 seconds behind the race leader is Ryan Briscoe in the 67 Chip Ganassi GT car that Richard Westbrook started. And eighth, uh, seventh position, excuse me, Jimmy Bruni. It's another 15 seconds further back. Porsche not on the pace today. No, I haven't been all weekend long, and uh, I'm surprised they, uh, well, Su surprise period, but I'm also surprised they have been closer to the pace during the race than they were early in the weekend. I mean, everywhere that we've gone lately, they've been really, really fast. This track, we talked about earlier on, didn't we, Owen? I mean, this track isn't particularly different to the other ones that we've been to lately. I mean, yes, it is, but uh, there's nothing fundamentally different about this place compared to Red America or... or uh, Canadian Time Motorsport yeah, Park. Or even Lime Rock. I mean, yeah, they are completely different kinds of race track, but like I say, there's nothing fundamental about this place I would have thought that would have made such a difference. No, I mean, there really isn't. I mean, as far as the aero and the slow turns that you have here, the biggest thing I can think is just the grip level here. It's way more than Road America. Limark's got, got some pretty good grip in it, but this track has got a lot of grip in it. Like I said, I drove earlier in the, before the race, and the track is just... It's, it'll, it'll take your shoe off. You go out there and step, your shoe's going to stay on the pavement, your, your foot's coming out of it. So I don't know if they just had, couldn't get a hold with the Michelin tires. I'm not sure what they're doing there uh, on the tire choice that they took for this weekend. But I it's, think it's, that's it's, it. Yeah. I, I think that you've hit the nail on the head. I really do. I think because there's a, the, you talked about earlier on, John, there's a lot of the selection choices that they have amongst the tires here, it seems, and a lot of them, they run different compound tires on different corners of the car. Uh, and if they haven't got that balance quite right, that uh, could be a factor. Three different uh, temperature range on the slick uh, selections from Michelin, all being utilized by the various teams in GT 
Le Mans this weekend. The other thing I would say, and I, I haven't got anything to back this up because I haven't looked at the stats, and Jeremy has, so he might know, is that new Porsche is very, very draggy. It's got a lot of aero in inbuilt with that diffuser and the new underbody aerodynamics on that car. And I just wonder whether their VMAX here isn't up there. Again, I, I, I haven't looked, but um, at Lime Rock, they were unbeatable yes, for, yeah. for that reason, because they have so much downforce. And I'm not sure how much they can it's quote, not quote, wind off. It, it's not been good. And, and in fact, I spoke to a couple of the Porsche guys about that. They, they are losing a little bit, but they, they're losing in traction more than anything else. Ah. And again, I wonder whether that comes down to the tyre choice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I think they're one of the teams that maybe didn't test here also. We talked about not it in a pre meeting here. No. I don't think they tested here. The unmistakable rumble of a Chevy Corvette. And that Chevy Corvette is in fifth position at the moment. It's Ollie Gavin heading through turn 10, the south bend, through that little dip and heading up into the oak tree corners. Just ahead of him is. Yeah, actually, the the, uh, the the GTLM Porsches have been slower than uh, the, the, their slowest by the a mile and a half or, or two, uh, yeah, a mile or so at least uh, on the on on everybody else. The Corvettes have been quickest on the straight, say 166. Uh, the Porsches have been doing 162, so that's quite a lot of three and a half miles an hour. Uh, they've been slower than the, the actually they've been slower than the Porsche GTD cars and the Lamborghinis and uh, the Acura as well. In fact, one of the Audis too. So, you know, they're, they're going no faster than GTD cars, the majority of GTD cars. Well, let's uh, have an update on the on matters rubber uh, round and black and sort of magical in race cars. It is literally a black arch. Shea Adam, give us a tyre update. And they're not all the same. Uh, rocking up and down the pit lane, just sort of casually glancing at what tyres will be going on the cars next because Owen warned us scuff rubber from some of the teams. Well, the Continental teams that are higher up in the championship, that being the 63, the 33, uh, its teammate, the 50, which is not up there in the championship, but still pit block next to it, the 57 and the, what was the other car I saw? The 96, they all have scuffed continental rubber that will be going on the car the next time through. I can tell because there's like grass and marbles and all sorts of things, almost as if the tires have been used as rollers this weekend spare. They have touched the ground before with the weight of the car on them. But for the Michelin runners, for BMW, Corvette, Porsche, Ferrari, Ford, they're all shiny and brand new, fresh out of the box, almost like it's Christmas morning. These tires have never been used, so that's what we'll be seeing for the cars next time they come in for their pit stops. Owen, oh, spot on. 66 Ford picking up some attention from spectators here at the track and further afield. Had a couple of tweets into at IMSA Radio, and thank you for this left rear uh, some kind of overflow pipe is overflowing it's kind uh, of been doing that since the start of the race yeah. i saw i noticed that out off the back side I, I think that's the water overflow i just wonder if the temperatures are getting up a bit he has been off the track a couple of times if it's been doing it for an hour plus, that's that's a long time though, isn't it? Yeah, it is a long time, yeah, because I noticed it early on. We're only 81 uh, air temp. I mean, it's not that hot out here today. On the track, 87 degrees Fahrenheit, 81.6 in the air. Uh, still quite humid, 45% here. And just clouding over, the sunshine will be diminished in a moment by a slightly darker grey cloud than we like to see. But the, at the moment, the sun is still casting shadows as the 48 Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini heads into the roller coaster at the end of the back straight. And that, at the moment, being driven with some aplomb by Brian Sellers. He's got about a second and a half on Jack Hawksworth, who is fighting his way back towards him. And Alessandro Balzan has closed in to within 10 seconds now of Jack Hawksworth. Uh, that Closing, the, it's actually, that, that's actually gone out oh, a has bit. it? Yeah. Sorry, I was just looking at the last lap when he took uh, a bit of time out of it, because as I go through this time, it chains over and, and Jack's back up the speed again. Must have been a bit of traffic for the 15 car. 
gone on a bit. He hasn't changed an awful lot over the last, you know, quite a few laps. But it has gone out a little bit. Still just shaking my head at the lack of performance from the 911 and 912. Remember, Patrick Pile is off the lead lap in GTLM. And that is, yes, a mistake by Patrick, but just no pace in the two new RSRs. John Edwards, uh, several laps down now. In fact, still 11 laps down, which is what he was down when he came out after the power steering problems yeah. on the 24. Hasn't lost any more ground, but because, of course, we've had no full course yellow, he hasn't been able to make any ground back up again. No, sitting in ninth position. Yeah, too far back to be able to, to even dream about that, unfortunately. But he has been showing good pace. Yeah, since the car got back on track, it's, it's running very every bit as quick uh, as everybody else. In fact, uh, the fastest lap of the race in, has been set by the uh, number 25 car of Bill, driven now by Bill Roblin. The time was set early on, though, in the race by by uh, Alexander Sims, and uh, the number 24 car has been pretty much matching those times within a, a few tenths of a second. The only other car that's in the 40... Oh, no, no scratch that. 41.5, then, the fastest lap of the race by the BMWs. Number, there's Mike Skeen having a problem. Number 80, Lone Star uh, AMG Mercedes, bringing that car slowly down towards the pits. Uh, 41.6 has been turned by the Dirt Mueller Joey Hand uh, Ford GT, car number 66. The uh, Corvettes are both lapped uh, at around about 42 flat. 41.999 if you want to be... Uh, <laughs> A a picky. Uh, and uh, picky. A, a Tony Freeland uh, 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 identical times as well. Well, while we're talking about Ford, let's go down to the Chip Ganassi racing team for performance. Here's Shea Adam. The headline before the race even began was Joey Hand on pole. And Joey, you got to drive out there for a little while, handed it over to Dirk Mueller. Fans around the track have noticed that there's a little bit of uh, water of some sort coming out of the back of the car, but nobody's worried on your pit box, are they? No, I haven't even heard about it on the radio, so nobody's worried about it. I think it's just one of our uh, oil vent tubes or something like that, uh, steaming. But, um, yeah, no big deal with that. We're just we're trying to push hard here, see if we see if we can stay close here, get a yellow. I, I drove hard. The, the track's a little weird. It's a little greasy. Don't know if it's, um, you know, like rubber from other series. It's We're trying to pull up and get off the track. When I was getting out of the car last few laps, before I got out, uh, the track seemed to be getting better and better. So... Uh, but same thing. We Dirk's saying the car's a little loose, same as I was thinking. But we're, uh, you know, we're looking to be, we're looking to be a little quicker in the Ferrari. Just can't get by. I mean, this is a tough racetrack, so fast. Get some arrow push behind guys, but uh, Dirk's working on it. If we get back by the Ferrari and then and get a yellow and, and uh, get bunched up again, this could this could be a real show to the finish. Well, you mentioned yesterday that you really wanted to get a new Babendum trophy for your son because it's his birthday today. You feel like you might still be able to deliver on that promise? Oh, we got we got a ways to go here for sure. You know, I mean, I always like to finish these races and be in the dogfight, but you know, Dirk has proven time and time again he's a he's the guy you want in there also. And uh, so, if we can get that yellow, I mean, without a yellow, I think it's it's gonna be tough. But if we get a yellow, it's a medium based game. You know, you can you can really fight these things in. But yeah, that trophy, I hear it's a gold one maybe this time if you win. And uh, that's a special Michelin man at our house. So yeah. My son's birthday today, so happy birthday, but uh, we're, we're going to get him some kind of trophy. It's up to us. Good luck. Thank you. Shea Adam down in the pit lane with Joey Hunt. And he is being called back to the pit box, so perhaps something happening there. No word from Chip Ganassi Racing or Ford Performance about uh, what's happening next year as yet. The initial two years of the Ford commitment comes to an end at the end of this year. If you remember, though, after the Le Mans victory, that was extended to four years. Still waiting to hear what happens with the drivers and the, the rest of the programme. Hopefully, we'll see them back in IMSA competition and, indeed, in Le Mans and World Championship uh, competition for next year. BMW coming to join in the GTLM ranks with their new car. And that car also eligible for Le Mans. So exciting times for the GT classes. Recognised here by IMSA by putting together this GT only race for the Mission and GT Challenge 2017. A race, uh, as we heard from Sarah Robinson from Michelin earlier on, is uh, on the calendar for next year with Michelin support. And the official tyre 
of VIR is now Michelin. So Babendum will be uh, spending a little more time here. This he does look good for 110 years old. Very good indeed. An hour and seven minutes to go. Here's how it stands in GT Daytona. Jaron Mull leads by 12 seconds in the 16 change racing Lamborghini from the 96 Turner BMW. Yassi Kron uh, has been driving that car from the start, as has Jaron Mull. Trent Hinman doing the middle stint in the 33 Mercedes. The AMG is another 25 seconds further back in third position. 12 seconds away from a podium spot at the moment. Last year's winning car, the 48 black and red Lamborghini of Paul Miller Racing. Huge crowd here this weekend. And finishing off the top six in GTD, Jack Hawksworth in the 15 Lexus, recovering after being down as low as 15th position in class after a first corner spin. And Alessandro Balzan, important there, that's our championship leader, defending champions in class and also championship leading 63 Scuderia Corsa, Ferrari, another 12 seconds behind Hawksworth. Hawksworth, by the way, has got right up behind Brian Sellers. He has a next in line behind Balzan is a Gunnar Jeanette in number 50, uh, Riley Mosehorst Porsche. Uh, a good job by that team. Uh, they started towards the back, but uh, Cooper McNeil did a nice, drove a nice first in. To Gunnar Jeanette is now trying to hang on ahead of uh, Jerome Moy. He's in danger of going a lap down, so if there was to be a full course caution, he wants to try and stay on a lead lap. I'm not sure he's going to be able to do it. At the head of the field in total, as for a moment of the start and finish line, we get one, two, at three, four wide as the BMW number 24 comes out of the pit. And once again, the Lexus very quick indeed. The BMW trying to get through was the leader. And in that, where we had four cars right across the start finish line, Brian Sellers has lost his fourth position to Jack Hawksworth. Man, those GTD cars are quick. And that Lexus, Owen Trinkler, that's a car to be in right now because that car is loving these conditions at this part of the fuel room. No, it is. Like I said earlier in the show, we talked to a couple of drivers and it's got legs on the straightaway here, which is great at this track. And, uh, and the, for the folks that haven't been here, that kink through the front stretch here, which we're probably going to see again here, is pretty narrow, Jeremy. It's tough to go through yeah. four wide there, which these guys did here because the 73 was pitting during this move also. He gets up the inside here and, and takes the apex away, but now we've got the BMW coming to the outside and then the BMW leaving Pitt Road. This gets really narrow here. Yeah. So let's uh, give you that rundown in GT Le Mans that was interrupted by that little bit of action. So the head of the field, Bill Oberlin, has uh, been enjoying a lovely Sunday afternoon drive. 23 yes. seconds ahead of Tony Vlander. That gap remains pretty, pretty much constant here, yeah, all the way through the stint. I like what Owen was saying earlier on, when he's got that kind of cushion, doesn't have to take too many chances, he can do a bit of lift and coast if he needs to, maybe save a, a little bit of fuel because he's not having to fight. Tony Vlander is on it all the time, just trying to hold on to that second position. And of course, Dirk Muller, he's on and off it as well, on the throttle, off the throttle, trying every way he can to just find half a mile an hour at the start of one of these long straights that will turn into an overtaking maneuver by the end of it no no bill bill's been out there so far we've almost forgotten he's in the race you know because we haven't we've been watching that battle for a second hello, bill. <laughs> oh, no. hello. we'll wave next time round i know no, finally the, we, we got a, a view him on the camera here so he's been way out there and he can definitely kind of conserve the fuel and get the fuel mileage they need to get now yeah and uh, talking of which we'll, we'll be, uh, we'll be expecting the final round of pit stops before long in the next, uh, certainly the next 10 minutes. Probably nearer to five, actually. Yeah, that's what I was getting ready to ask you. I mean, when do you think they're going to make this final pit stop? We're getting uh, just over an hour to go yeah, in this thing. Yeah, so it, it won't be long. It'll be the next seven or eight minutes. Yeah, they could do, what, about 55 minutes, do we think? Yeah, I think fuel consumption around here is actually a little bit better than uh, some of the other tracks they go to. Yeah, it's, I mean, you're, you're on the gas here a lot. You yeah, know, you're you know, down this long back straightaway that we're looking at right now, and then also up the S's. It's flat out all the way, so you're, you're burning a lot of a lot of fuel here, but you can conserve some down through roller coaster and hog pit in that area. I mean, the way that this race is flowing now, I wonder if anybody's going to try to short pit, though, and, and gamble on a caution here at the end. We saw the Ferrari with the stop that they had. They obviously leaped up into second, but see if they can cut into this gap here on this last stop here. 
yeah, I, I, I don't think it's, it's worth taking that gamble because the chances of, go, of going yellow I think are pretty slim around here. So I think you can't. You, you, they'll come in as soon as that window opens to get to the end. I'm sure, but I don't think we're going to see anybody taking a real gamble and coming in you know, significantly earlier and hoping for a yellow. I don't think. I don't think it's worth that risk. Well, the 25 BMW with an hour and two minutes, 62 minutes, is in the pit lane. Bill Oberlin brings the 25 BMW down this long run towards its pit, and Shane Adam is waiting for him. The BMW team adopting the strategy that we often see by Risi Competizione. They are doing a second driver team. Bill Oberlin, who was out there entirely by his own, probably doesn't even know there are other cars involved in this race, has handed the car back over to the qualifying and starting driver, Alexander Sims. So it will be up to Alex Sims to bring this 25 machine home. He's already done that twice this year for wins. That was Canadian Time Motorsport Park and Watkins Glen. They gave him four new Michelin tires. Those are brand new. He has no problem problem leaving his pit box when the 24th sister car came in. Martin Tomczyk got behind the wheel, stalled it, didn't know what went wrong actually when he did stall it because it was something mechanical and that car's already having a rough day. Another car having a rough day, the 48 Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini, the defending race winners. Guess what tire went down guys? Left, Left rear. rear. Yeah, okay. And it's that car is out again. Should be able to go to the end from there though, Jeremy, so that might not be a, I mean, all right, he's lost some real estate and track position, but everyone else has still got to make their last pit stop. Something I noticed in that uh, Real Letterman Lanigan pit stop, the BMW pit stop, there was no panic. It was all just like, oh, yeah, okay. It was almost like they were yeah. doing it in slow motion, wasn't it? Yeah, and that's what the best pit stops do look like because they, these guys are so practiced, uh, particularly our, our team, BMW team RLL, have been, this, been around this business a long, long time. Nothing phases those those guys. Uh, from Continental Tires, uh, on the tyre situation, the teams were all given recommendations for camber. Looks like one or two may have put too much camber at the back of the car. That can lead to higher temperatures on the inside edge of the tyre, ultimately causing fatigue on the tyre belt. That's just been sent through to us from Cockney, so exactly what uh, Owen was talking about uh, earlier on. Inside the last hour, and still Tony Vlander. I mean, this has been a brilliant display of drive. I don't think Muller has got a proper passing opportunity in, it seems like we've been watching this for 45, 50 minutes, but he's never really got the nose alongside to, to try and make a pass. No, he's definitely been trying in certain areas, and he's been kind of putting the nose out there and see if he can distract him at all. But I mean, these guys are professionals, and it's tough to for to get them to make a mistake. And Jeremy, my question to you: Alexander Sims is back in this. GTLM is still out there running some of these other cars. Do you think that's enough fuel? I mean, if, as a driver for me, is he going to have to conserve something here at the end to, to make it to the end? I'm, I'm pr presuming not. Um, no, I think he should be okay. He made his first pit stop after 29 laps. Second one was after 57, and um, it's short. It's, it's, no, I, I think we should be fine because yeah. it's. Uh, I think we should be fine. It's only well, it's 58 minutes to go, isn't it? That's yeah, right. came in with an yeah. hour and two. Yeah, yeah. Hour two, because yeah. I, I, I saw yeah. it come in. I just want to ask you, you're keeping yeah. the stats here. As, as a driver, we got to go run to a fuel number, which they, they've got a healthy, healthy yeah. lead here. I mean, his first stop was it was uh, two minutes, two laps before the hour, so 56, seven, 56, 57 minutes. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And both Porsches are in the pit lane, Shea Adam. But both GTLM Porsches, I should say, Shea. Yes, it was Dylan tires for the 911, and it will be the same for the 912. No driver change for either of those cars. The first of our front running cars, the number 67 in GTLM, has followed in that number 25. So clearly, we are within that window where all the teams feel confident to get to the end. It is Ryan Briscoe behind the wheel of the 67 as it hits its marks, and it will be when the car pulls out as well. New tires and fuel for the Ford. Jerome Moore running I, very, yeah, very I, wide. What we're and seeing off the there, surface, yes. got dirty 
dirty tyres. Now, you remember I talked a while ago that Gunnar Jeanette was trying to stay on the lead lap? Yeah. Well, he, that's what he's been doing for, since then. Whoa. And uh, Mull, I think, was getting frustrated. I was just about to talk about that because the gap had come down just a little bit, down to under 10 seconds from over from 12, 13, 14, what it, what it had been. Mull was definitely getting frustrated there, being unable to find a way past that Porsche of Gunnar Jeanette. Now, no don't question. For, don't forget, there's a minimum drive time to get points, which is 45 minutes yeah. in GT Daytona. So we are within 10 minutes of that now, both the 96 and the second place. Well, that's Jesse that, that, that's and Jerome Mull the, in I the think 16. The, no, no, because Jesse Crohn's he's, a, he's a, a silver driver in any case, isn't he? I think. Right. So, I don't think that's, so that's, that's not a problem. Okay. Um, for that car. Who's the other one you're talking about? Uh, 96, both the Lexuses. They haven't changed drivers since the start. 16 hasn't. Uh, sorry, no, the Lexus has changed because Robert Alon is in that car. So Serge Karam got out of that. Uh, Pruitt hasn't driven yet. And Correct. so that is the Jack Hawksworth car. Jack's been in for... Uh, all of the 58 laps that that car has turned. Uh, Alessandro Balzan, by the way, still in fifth position. And, uh, that's good points for the championship. Exactly what they need to do. Vlander leads, by the way, now, of course, after the pit stops. So, Ferrari leading again. And Jeremy, you did say that that is a frugal car. We've seen the Fords with their three and a half litre V6 turbocharged eco boost engine. We've seen it boost and be very quick. We've also seen it, particularly in the hands of Richard Westbrook, be very eco and being able to last a very long time with its fuel mileage. Tony Vlander going very long here on this stop because a fizzy. When did Fizzy come in? I thought that Ferrari was one of the earliest stoppers. So this is. No, he was uh, he was he was last. He and the number four car were the last two to okay. pit, and that was right on the hour mark. Thirty-two laps since he last pitted. Oh, sorry, it was that last pit was on lap thirty-two. My apologies. And so he has now been running for fifty eight laps into the pits comes the second place Dirk Muller the 66 Ford is heading to Shea Adam no driver change will be going on for the number 66 at the 96 the Turner BMW made eight stop fuel tires and a driver change so Jesse Krohn is out and Jens Klingmon is in for the number 66 stopping perfectly on its marks the car in the box immediately ahead of it also on the pit lane that is the 63 Scuderia Course Ferrari the GTV points leader coming into this race fuel and tires for that car as well but it's going to cause an issue for the 66 when it goes to leave and now I see that overflow that smoke and vapor that's coming out of the back of the 66 that eagle-eyed people around the track around the world were noticing that is standard quo that does happen during endurance races we see it more often as the 66 is revved within an inch of its life the fuel hose still attached though now he's set free the 63 was pushed just far enough into its box that it wasn't a problem. Interesting note, though, the 33, they are up on the wall. Jerome Blakemullen will be getting back in. So Trent Hinman this morning mentioned that they weren't sure what strategy they were going with. They are going to put the driver from the Netherlands back in. And meanwhile, another driver from the Netherlands getting out of the car. That would be the 16. Air Mull has made his package deliveries. He's handing over to Corey Lewis, and they are doing four tires and fuel for the 16 change racing Lamborghini. Came in from the lead. Let's see where they cycle back out this is the black and uh, luminous green 16 change Lamborghini it's been a great run by Jerome Mull leaving his co-driver around about 51 minutes 50 minutes of racing to do and again a completely unfussed stop the engine barely revved it was like he was pulling out of a supermarket car park after doing his Saturday night shop there Owen. and that's what you want to do no point in, in getting yourself too wound up before you get off the pit lane speed limit. Yeah, just nice and smooth and rolled away and uh, no mistakes. Those guys have been dominant all weekend since they rolled off the truck here in free practice one. Just no mistakes here. Now the Ferrari's in, see if they have a great stop here, if they can gain anything on the BMW here with this stop. So that means that Ollie Gavin, who stopped on, 
Antonio Garcia. Antonio Garcia's car last stopped on lap 31, 32 for Oli Gavin. So they must be coming to the end of their fuel as well. Fuel still going in, bit of cleaning of the radiator, a little bit of uh, extinguishment on the left rear, but I don't think that was a, an issue. Maybe just a little bit of heat there. And the 62 is down and away. Fizzy Keller back behind the wheel and where is the BMW? It should have gone through. Alexander Sims should have gone through, yeah, shouldn't it? Yes, he has. But did he get back out before Dirk Muller came around? I think he did. So Muller is still going to be behind the Ferrari. Yes, he did. And in fact, if anything, is a little further back. The 66 Ford then behind the same car, but now with Giancarlo Fisichella behind the wheel, although my timing screen hasn't updated that as yet. We'll check back in with Shea to speak to the team and maybe get a word with Tony Vlander if he did get out of the car. So the two Corvettes, first and second. Doug Feehan spoke to him, the project manager, at lunchtime, and he was saying there, despite their little... BOP still doesn't feel as though they're quite there, but he's happy to race with what they've got. Felt that they needed a little bit of yellow to play around with the strategy. Three and four come in from positions one and two. Antonio Garcia and Oli Gavin are in the cars right now. Shea Adam is there. Antonio Garcia will be taking the three to the finish. They are doing fuel and four Michelin tires for the car that came in with the number one on the side. The car that came in with the number two was the four Corvette. Oli Gavin has jumped out. They're putting Tommy Milner back into that car as they have completed the four tire change on the number four. Now it comes off the air jacks. Fuel still going into both of the Corvettes. They came in almost together, the three slightly ahead of the four. They should leave in the same order because the fueling has been going on in exactly the same time. There's the three firing up. There's the four. That was perfection from the Corvette Racing Pit Stops. Question now is, can he get into the first corner before the Ferrari? No, he can't. And round goes. Giancarlo Fisichella, although it still says Tony Vlander here, which is going to throw me off every time I look at the screen. But the Corvette has got out in front of the Ford. That's a position made up in the pit lane once again. Reese and Brad Miller doing great work in the pit lane to either move their cars forward or hold on to their positions. Now, the problem is for the three car is that he is on cold Michelin's and Dirk Muller has been out there now for, what, two, three, four laps, three laps. And he will have a little more grip. How long before those tyres come up to something like optimum temperature? Got to be half a lap to a lap around here. Yeah, it looked like we saw that with the Ferrari, maybe about a half a lap, but I mean, Garcia's got to be on it now. And, uh, and then the 66 has got to be in attack mode because he knows he just came out of the pit. So the opportunity to take him over, you know, is right now. So after the second and what we expect to be the final set of pit stops for the GTLM cars, Alexander Sims is back in the lead car, 20.277 seconds of a lead. Bill Oberlin did that middle stint, barely saw anybody else, Shea Adam. Bill, were you bored out there driving around all by yourself, leading the race? Sure, but no competition. You know, when you're going for a championship, I love those kind of races. You know, uh, earlier in the weekend, even though the car was fast, it was on the edge, uh, the M6 GTLM. And I gave it to my engineers, and I said, hey, we're going to hunk hunker this thing down in the rear, make some rear grip with these Michelin tires. And sure enough, they did. They gave an amazing car. Uh, my teammate drove it to the lead, and I just didn't want to do anything dumb. So I just extended a little bit more. And at the end, we picked something up, got a little puncture, and that pulled us in early. Now we're... Uh, we're very, very tight on fuel, but we'll have to see uh, how this plays out. If, if any of the other cars would like to have an issue and park on the track, I wouldn't be totally against that. That'd be really lovely. I'm just kidding, by the way. I wondered why you sent Alexander out in fuzzy pink bunny slippers. I thought those belonged to Richard Westbrook. Was I say it again? I, I wondered why you sent him out in the fuzzy pink bunny slippers, but now it makes sense. Those normally belong to Richard Westbrook. Oh, is that right? See, I, I have no idea you know better than me, but... I mean, look at this. They're going to hunt us down. we got to run a pace. The best guy in the business at saving fuel and running a pace is Alexander. We've seen him do it before in Watkins Glen. It's exactly how it was. If, if he didn't run this certain fuel number, he wasn't going to make it to the end. And now we're doing the same thing again. Good luck. We've got three wins here. Hopefully it's four by the end of this race. Oh, thank you very much. 
So just to reiterate there, a puncture at the end of the stint for Bill Oberlin brought that car in a couple or three laps early and now tight on fuel. Uh, I, th I would have expected them to run to about lap 61, maybe 62, by the time you've had a couple of formation laps and running to the grid. And they did fewer laps on that second stint than they did on the first. And now we know Bill Oberlin uh, bringing that car in early. But a great middle stint from Bill Oberlin. Did exactly what you'd want from any teammate. Just bring it back in. And in fact, you know, the, the lead pretty much identical to, to when Sims handed the car over to him. No, he did a great job there, that middle stint there, and uh, kept the lead and maybe extended it a little bit, saved the car for the end here. But, but Jeremy, we talked earlier, now now he's got to run to this fuel number. And to me, here at Bill there, uh, they may be a lap or two short here. It's going to be tight. It's going to be yeah, tight. Yeah, no, certainly uh, a good bit earlier than they would have wanted to, to go in, uh, a little bit over an hour. The first, you know, the first stint, uh, like I said, it's about 56 to 57 minutes, so that's, that's a fair bit of fuel they're going to have to say. It's, it's not going to be easy, that's for dead sure. The fastest lap of the race so far, by the way, was Alexander Sims way back on lap 11, 141.5. Tony Vlander on a brand new set of Michelins, but with a heavy car, has just done a 41.8, the Ferrari's fastest lap of the race, and all of a sudden he's got four seconds of a lead over Tony, Tony Vlander, that's second and third, and Tony Vlander now has his mirrors full of Dirk Muller. So, so Dirk Muller, uh, sorry, that's uh, Fizzy, isn't it, uh, who is in the second place car. My apologies, Fizzy's just put that lap in. Yeah. Antonio Garcia with Dirk Muller now fighting a different car. He's going to think it's not his day today. Uh, and once again, that um, the uh, round of pit stops worked out in the Ferrari's favour. It's made ground over its competitors in the GTLM class. So that uh, fuel stuff that... Beaky Sims was talking about earlier in the weekend, scratch that, uh, like, like I suggested earlier on. Yeah, the, the IMSA does a really good job of trying to mandate that, and it's probably working in the Ferrari's favour rather than certainly isn't working against them. The other really interesting thing, though, is in GT Daytona, that lead of, uh, we saw it 14 seconds, it came down to under 10 when uh, Moore couldn't get past Gunnar Jeanette. Well, that that's problem has been solved because after the pit stops, uh, the uh, Corey Lewis has come out ahead of number 50 car, but look how far uh, the uh, Jens Klimmer car is behind him now. Uh, nothing at all. Yeah, two uh, more seconds. More contact to oh, I was wondering what report between again. Those two. This is the Jack Hawksworth Lexus going down the back straight, and Scott Pruitt involved there, couldn't get through. Then it was side by side on the front straight, and another little love tap between those two. And well, Hawksworth's to the left and then to the middle of the track. Stewart's to the right and then to the middle of the track. Play nicely, boys. Still got 44 minutes to go here. At the moment, no harm, no foul. Although, dear, I say that going through turn one, there was a, a secondary tap. Let's go down to the pit lane. Second place at the moment for Giancarlo Fisichella. He's now 19 seconds behind Alexander Sims. And it is Giancarlo Fisichella behind the wheel. I can tell you that with some authority because Tony Vlander, who's just got out of the car, is talking to Shiana. For a comeback weekend, this hasn't been too bad. Uh, that whole stint, your mirrors were full of red, white, and blue. Just how hard did you have to push to keep the Ford behind you? Yeah, I mean, it was a quite a good wake up after the holidays. Uh, that was tough. Um, but I, at the same time, I must say, I think it was a Dirk, Dirk was in the car, so I must, I must say it was nice to drive because he, he kept it clean. Uh, had a quite good pace, wasn't super fast, but quite good. I started to stay on the road. It's a really, it's a really tricky track and really easy to make a mistake. So it takes a lot of commitment. And then I just backed off a little bit just to stay on the track all the time and, 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 and trying to keep and defend the position. The BMW is marginal on fuel. How are you guys to the end? Can you make it? No, we should be OK. I mean, uh, we, we should be OK. Uh, I know that in the beginning of the race we were really tight. There was like a one or two lap margin, uh, uh, but at the moment it looks quite good. Yeah, Tony, just seeing a replay on the screen of uh, Alexis and the Ferrari having a little bit of an off incident, uh, and he got thrown away from that. But thanks. It's about time that Reese Ferrari has a little bit of good luck. Yeah, the, the, fr the Ferrari is absolutely fine on fuel. No, no worries there whatsoever. Uh, dive down the inside, going into the pit lane. 
when uh, Tony came into the pit lane up the inside of, I think that was the 14. One of the Lexus. Of Le is. the Lexus. Sage Caron, by the way, back in that car. That's made a pit stop as well, sitting in uh, eighth position. Uh, here's how it stands in GT Daytona. Bit of a battle beginning to brew up at the front there, as Jeremy mentioned a little while ago, with Corey Lewis in the 16 change racing Lamborghini. Now, just 2.1 seconds ahead of Jens Klingmann, who's been set to stun by Turner BMW. In fact, it is two seconds exactly now. So 16 from 96, that's the black and green car from the blue and yellow. Blake Morland in third position back in the car, but he's dropped back some 47 seconds. Yeah. That's it. Uh, he's losing a lot of time uh, since around the pit stops for some reason. Not quite sure whether he's just kind of on cruise mode or, or, or why. Brian Sellers still holding down fourth position for Paul Miller Racing in the 48. Lamborghini, he's now got a three seconds gap back to Scott Pruitt in the number 15 Lexus, who uh, is uh, being very forceful indeed in his driving. Then it's Balzan in sixth position, Alessandro Balzan in the championship leading 63 car, another three seconds further back at the head of the field. And in GT Le Mans, BMW of Alexander Sims is being closed down on by Giancarlo Fisichella. Two parts to this story. Number one, Giancarlo Fisichella is driving absolutely brilliantly. A 141.918 last time around, and he's closing in. But Alexander Sims is on fuel save mode. They are a couple, maybe three laps short of going all the way, the 40 minutes, to the end of this race. If you missed the uh, update from the pit lane, Bill Orbel and Stint cut, for, cut a couple or three laps short because of a tyre problem. The tyre was going down, they see it on the telemetry. Bill brought the car in with uh, no loss of time and no damage, but what it has done is taken them slightly out of their fuel window to get all the way to the end of the race. And Alexander Sims last time around in fairly clear air, a 43-3, that's a couple of seconds slower than we know that he could go, but he is on fuel numbers at the moment. That's what he's looking on his dash. He'll be changing up a little bit earlier. Third position for Tonio Garcia, who is fueled to the end and has just put the number three Corvettes fastest lap of the race in at a 141.914. And Dirk Muller is right in behind him in the 66 Ford. Muller also fueled to the end in that Chip Ganassi racing car, has just put his fastest lap of the race in, and the cars are 41.6. So it's getting really, really exciting. Everybody's turning up the wick from second on down. Alexander Sims is saving fuel. Possibly changed a fuel map on that car, maybe just lifting and coasting. What's the best thing that you can do around here to make your fuel numbers go? The biggest thing is just want to roll the speed through the center of the corner. They always just roll the speed there and just nice and easy back to the gas. I'm sure those guys have a fuel map. Uh, it's kind of fuel safe mode that they can go to. The biggest thing, guys, that we need to start watching for is how the clock runs out. Remember, this is not a lap race. Depending on where the time runs out or where it gets close to, he could actually do an extra lap here yeah, that, they don't point. That, they, that they don't want to do. So, uh, but just to kind of see as this clock winds down here at the end, what's going to happen? Well, he's picked up his pace a little bit at 42.9 last time around, but all of a sudden, Giancarlo Fisichella is under 16 seconds behind the leader. This could be a grandstand finish, and I'll give Owen Trinkler his due. He said, watch the Ferrari in the last part of the race. So they are, and we saw that that Ferrari was strong, Owen, on used tyres at the end of the last stint from Vlander. It was, he started to pull away from the Ford there. Yeah, and that could be, that could be really important. Well, Jeremy Shaw, this has been another cracking event. This has been flat out for the last hour and seven minutes, uh, two hours and seven minutes. And this is exactly what we like to see in our IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. The Michelin GT Challenge once again delivering great entertainment for a huge crowd here. Another fastest lap from Garcia, 141.8. Dirk Muller with the fastest last sector of anybody in the race at the Ford. Oh yeah, we're starting to throw overhand now. This is getting serious, Jeremy. Well, it is, yeah. Uh, we're after the... Uh after the, the round of pit stops was completed, number 25 BMW held a lead of 20 seconds over the uh, number 62 Ferrari of Giacomo Fisichella. Well, that uh, deficit is now down to 15 seconds in one, two, three, four, five, six laps. So 
a better part of a second a lap that uh, gap has been reduced by. So we're certainly going to have to watch that. There's, what, 37 minutes to go in a race. Uh, that's going to be... How many laps is that going to be? 20 laps or thereabouts. Um, so uh, at that rate, <laughs> uh, Alexander Sims has got a problem. <laughs> well, when does he get onto his fuel number? I mean, what he'll want to do is try and get those... Oh, no, he'll be on, he'll be on that already. He'll, right from the, the moment he left the pit lane, they know how much fuel they have, they know True. how long there is to go in the race. That's a good point. But if that's the pace, if that's the only pace he's got, it's not fast enough to win the race. Well, wait and see. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, it's just going to get interesting here at the end. Yeah, yeah. Let's do another wrinkle into this race. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to throw something else in here. Uh, I've just... Did you ever play the game Grand Prix when you, you know, with the dice and if you got a double six, you had to take a chance card type of thing? Board game back in the 1970s. I'll not bore you with it now. However, let's see how throw the double six. It's clouding over as well. I don't think we're going to get a splash, but that would just throw another variable into what's going on. Meantime, in GTD, the battle for the lead is down to two and a half seconds. And what that means is that Jens Klingmann, who we know is a... A uh, very fast, sometimes impetuous driver can see the back of Corey Lewis's Lamborghini as they're going up towards the oak tree. And also, Alessandro Balzan can see the back of Scott Pruitt. And he, in fact, he's right underneath the rear wing in the battle for fifth and sixth in GT Daytona. That's on the front straight now. The Ferrari's got to run. He's right underneath. Almost had to lift off there just as we're coming to the start-finish line. Jinx to drivers left. We Going to be forced around the outside. Championship leader this is. Shouldn't be taking too many chances. And, of course, he doesn't because it's Alessandro Balzan. Oh, a little bit impetuous with the right foot there and just spun up the rear Continentals. Almost got too close to the back of the Lexus there, I think. Yeah, I think he was trying to do the crossover move, starting the outside and come back to the inside. But that's going to set him up for the outside at turn three, which these guys have been sneaking up on the top oh, five yeah. here. I mean, they've just been sort of quiet all day today, and now look where they are. Well, yeah, because they both have problems right at the beginning of the race, uh, but they've been uh, now, you know, been closing in ever since. Uh, and the other interesting thing is uh, we've got a new fastest lap of the race. <laughs> That's so. in the second place car, Giancarlo Fisichella. <laughs> and the lead is down to 14 seconds. Yeah, she stabilized on that last lap. Mm, but it was 1.1 seconds the lap before. Fisichella is on it. And Alessandro Sims has speeded up as well, a 42.5. Fastest lap lap time around from the leading three went to Tony Garcia. Another fastest lap of the race for the Corvette number three, a 141.4. Now, Balzan here on the back straight. Uh, where is he sitting at the moment? He's sitting in sixth position. They've got a decent, if not huge, lead in the championship, Jeremy, the 63 car. How hard does he need to push to get past Pruitt? He he doesn't uh, really because he wants to make sure he doesn't get taken out and right. the, you know, the Lexus team they're, they're uh, desperate for a good finish uh, but uh, Sc certainly Scott Pruitt hasn't had the same sort of pace in that car I think it's fair I think it's fair to say than uh, the Jack Hawks would. and um, that you know he's coming under increasing pressure now yeah Jimmy I think he'd set him up into the back straightaway into roller coasters where it's going to be a little bit safer to make that move instead of down into turn one and do that crossover move that he's looking at last lap. Yeah, it certainly isn't going to be easy to make a pass, that's for sure, because uh, Scott Pruitt doesn't like being overtaken, does he? No. As Paul Tracy say on his uh, IndyCar shows, Pruitt fade, he calls it. Pruitt fade, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we've already seen him fade down the back straightaway. Not him, particularly today, but the Lexus. Yeah, yeah. true. So He's been teaching it to his teammates. Yeah. Balzan right underneath the, underneath the rear wing as they head towards the crossover bridge and go under it now. Left, right, left, right. Balzan's got a great car underneath him that he can move around so much in the disturbed air behind the Lexus. Yeah, and, and John, that, the Lexus punches a big hole in the air, so a lot of turbulence coming up off, off, the, off that car. We saw it right there in the S's. He actually lost a little bit of ground right there, but set him up at Oak Tree and see what kind of run he gets here. Lexus fast in a straight line. It's big, it's bulky, but it's quick. The Ferrari 
A little bit more svelte, closer to the ground, but a wide car, as we've mentioned before with the GTE version. He's dragging up, he's going to drive his left, but he's not going to be close enough. Scott Pruitt eases in from the middle of the road to that little left kink. It, lo it looks odd from our camera position how the, the drivers ease from the middle of the road, and it looks like they're deliberately closing the door, but you can't see quite well enough there is that left kink, and it's a much more pronounced left kink than it shows on the camera before the right-handed part of the, the roller coaster. No, it is, John. It's blind as you come up in there, then it crests and you go downhill to the right-hander as you come down into roller coaster. See him trying the outside here, see if he tries the crossover move again. Yeah, that because that Ferrari is really fleet at the end of the straight, it's really slippery uh, aerodynamically, and it, it closes right in on Alexis, and he's getting a little bit frustrated. He's got, he's got, he's got the inside, inside to three. Oh. inside, but yeah, Scott Pruitt again. He, he's got to make sure he doesn't, he doesn't overstep the mark, hasn't he, and make a be forced off the road. Yeah. But certainly, you know, Scott Prude is losing quite a bit of ground now. Uh, the, the car was ahead of the number 48 Lamborghini because Jack Hawkins had made that pass. Uh, so, uh, and now the number 48 car, Brian Sellers, he's, he's put uh, nearly 10 seconds between himself and uh, Scott Pruitt, and that's, that's it within the last 10 laps. Well, I've been praising Balzan so much for his patience. We talked about passing zones in the Michelin, countdown to green and the keys to the race. He's got to now spend a lap or two, I think, looking for somewhere else by because, oh, hang on a second, Lexus has made a mistake and Pruitt is off and he's in the wall. Very odd manoeuvre, looked like he lost the rear end of the car, maybe losing a little bit of grip from the rear tyres there. He's in the wall at the oak tree. Now, will he get this car out of there? Engine, I think, was still running. Yeah, he's still got power, can't find reverse though. Now. Race Control will be watching this, and Alexander Sims will be fingers crossed that this does not go full course yellow. The lead is stabilised at 14 and a half seconds at the front of the GTLM field. Corey Lewis has stabilised his lead over Jens Klingman at three seconds. He's doing a great job, Corey Lewis. Interesting tactics, by the way, from Change Racing to put Mullin for the two stints at the start. Corey Lewis, nowhere to hide now towards the end of the race. So coming into the oak tree, Owen, just what, took a little bit too much speed on the Lexus? Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like, I don't know if he has any braking issues going on there. If Shea can find out, it's like he just didn't slow down enough, mm. though, as he came in there. And the car just got loose on him, and he just couldn't turn the car. It, I noticed yesterday it got really slippery at that end of the track. I had to kind of back off. I charged in there in the oak tree. I couldn't get the car to turn. Well, we've seen a lot of cars off, off there over this 11, weekend. 11, the entrance to the oak tree, has been the bogey corner for pretty much everyone. And we've seen some very, very experienced drivers who have been struggling around there the car is moving again uh, extensive damage to the left front and carbon fiber is being thrown off oh it looks like the the bonnet the hood is going to come off that car as well and it's on the driver's side it's going to get ugly Pruitt is going to have to slow down Scott Pruitt getting off the racing line as best he can but it's shedding body parts Half an hour to go, 29 minutes to be sure, and he can't get the car stopped. He's got bits of the bodywork underneath the left-hand wheel. Really struggling, but he will get it back to the pit lane, I think. Oh, right out in front of the Gunner Jeanette number 50 BMW. Scott Pruitt is fighting this car. He doesn't want to go where he's pointing it. He may have even done a steering arm on this car. Yeah, the suspension on the left-hand side, the wheels at a very jaunty angle, but somehow, Scott Pruitt, having made the mistake, he has battled that car. He's cajoled it and beaten it into submission and got it into the pit lane. Shea Adam is watching a very second-hand looking Lexus come to a halt. When he pulled to a stop, John, the grate that actually covers the radiator, it completely fell off and there was just a load of dirt and grass that fell out from that area. They have pulled the bonnet off putting it up on the air jacks. It's going to be a lengthy stop. Scott Pruitt has not yet gotten out from behind the wheel of the Lexus, although they are putting new Contis on the rear, pulling off the front tires. Ooh, there was a lot of almost baseball play that came out of that uh, left front tire, the area at least. 
but definitely, well, let's see. We're going to find out if there's left front suspension damage because they're putting a new Continental tire on. It did not move when they put the tire on. Normally, if there's some serious suspension damage, everything will sort of bounce around a little bit, but they've taken the hood off. I think they're going to try and send them back out without the hood on. And there is more damage to the nose. Ooh, I don't know that I would even send them back out. Well, whilst that car's in the pit lane, the number 50 Porsche. Gunnar Jeanette has gone through into sixth position, and Fizzy Keller has uh, dropped down to sixth was position. That, was that the last lap he... he what's that there? Uh, is it a timing glitch? No, I don't think it can be, because he just came through now. Right, well, whilst we were excited about the action at the front of the field, Fisichella has dropped down. His last lap was fine, yes, a 42 it was. three. And all of a sudden, Garcia is second, Muller is third, Milner is fourth, Briscoe is fifth, and Fisichella, having been challenging for the lead and being within 13 seconds, is now yeah, 34 man. seconds back. Yeah, it was the previous lap. Uh, I, I certainly didn't uh, see what happened. Yeah, we did see it on our shot here. I wonder if something happened to come into roller coaster. When Scott Pruitt came down to roller coaster there, a lot of dirt came out of the car, and I don't know, he may be the next car through. We didn't see it on our cameras here. It's a very good point, actually. And here's something else for you. Lee Driggers has just fired this into me. Thank you, Lee. Can you remember a time in one of these races where we've not had a single lead change in the GT Daytona category? Because they came in and out without losing the lead on their pit stop, didn't they? Say with one of the last teams to stop. They stopped well, on lap 61. A, a, a lead change on track, I mean, yeah? I don't think we had a lead change, Jeremy, because they came in on apart, 61. Well, yeah, no, true, apart, apart from the first lap. No, that's right. Yeah. He's been uh, out on his own. He pulled, you know, he got, got past on the first lap and then pulled away, basically, although the gap now is uh, down to 11 and a half seconds. Uh, at the front of the field for BMW, yes, but now it's back to Tony Garcia. Fizzy Keller Indeed, is... Which is a lot closer. Yes. Fizzy Keller is on his own. It's not a timing glitch. He has come through. And Shea Adams been talking to the uh, to the Reese team. Shea, what can you tell us about that 62 car? They don't actually know where he went off, John. They didn't see it on their video screens, but Fizzy radioed in something about being close to the Turner car, the number 96 BMW, ironically, pit box next to them. Uh, and then the next thing they knew, their car was in sixth place. Right, OK. Well, that would have been Jens Klingman, who's trying to chase down the leader in class. And he's got that down to 1.3 seconds. A lot of blue and maroon or purple on the timing screen. That means people putting in their bests or overall bests. And all of a sudden, Corvette, once again, are in a position to take a victory here. Tony Garcia and Tommy Milner in fourth position is charging as well. He's just two seconds behind Dirk Muller. And Corvette, again, while other people falter around them, are really, really turning up the wick. Milner's just gone by the leader in GTLM, who's slightly blocked around the yeah. first corner by Colin Brown, and that is allowing Jens Klingman to gain. You don't need to give Jens Klingman any help in closing that down. That man is very quick indeed. And there'll be a drive-through when the 15 Lexus leaves because the fire bottle was improperly manned. So Fizzy Keller then in the 62 car. Oh dear, Fizzy. Mm. Now I expected that, would you? No, really wouldn't. He was doing a great job. And just put the fastest lap in of the race. Remember, 141.2. Uh, yeah, he's just done it again. In fact, he's just put the fastest lap in again. Jeremy, 141.2 on yeah, lap well, he's going 78. To need to now. He's now. Well, he's got to. He's got to find 30 seconds to the lead, and I, I just can't see him doing that no. in 23 minutes but he's going to be absolutely gutted because the win was on for Dave Sims, for Giuseppe Risi, and for Risi Competizione. The team based in Houston, Texas, is bearing the brunt of Hurricane Harvey at the moment. All of the cars running with 
Stickers on, handed out by the IMSA officials today. Texas strong. 42-1 for Jimmy Bruni is the Porsche's fastest lap of the race. And see, I was very confused there by seeing Fizzy Keller's name and Bruni's name uh, one above the other. But of course, those days of those being teammates, long gone now. And there's the tail now for uh, GT Daytona. Uh, we've got a battle on this. Still can't find a way past Colin Brown. That uh, Colin Brown is... Uh, no, he's not, on, he's not even just trying to stay on a lead lap. He's two laps down. Uh, and okay, good. Well done, Colin Brown. Excellent. Yeah, smart Heads up driving there by Colin. He gets out of the way and uh, just pulls over and lets all those uh, lead cars go through. Well done. Yeah. Ryan Briscoe, though, is going to spoil Jens Klingman's party. Getting conflicting reports from people around the circuit here at VIR about what happened there. Uh, there was close competition, shall we say, between the 96 of Jens Klingman, who pulls over right in front of the Ford and uh, Fizzy Keller. Now, Jens Klingman's in his own battle, but he still has to be mindful that there are other cars there that are running their own race, and faster cars too. Race control, I am sure, will sort it out. I haven't heard that they are looking at that yet, and they may not have a report on that as yet. But if we hear anything from race control on the radio, we'll let you know. And uh, so that battle for the lead in GTD continues. Uh, a long, long way back in third place now, Jerome Blakeman, 52 seconds. That's gone out by pretty, probably half a second a lap uh, since the final round of pit stops. Uh, he, in turn, is uh, quite a long way clear of, well, 12 and a half seconds clear of uh, Brian Sellers. But the man on the move, once again, having got uh, with the, the Lexus out of the way, Balzan is now charging. He's got that gap to Brian Sellers down to four seconds. That's down by almost a second a lap. Uh, I can tell you that it was turn three by a weight of numbers that Fizzy went off. Turn three, and that was side by side with the Turner car. And uh, depending on your point of view, uh, they run out of track or uh, the BMW ran Fizzy off the track. I'm, I'm, I'm not making any kind of judgment on that. That's the reports that we're getting in from people who saw it. Those are eyewitness reports to IMSA radio, at IMSA radio. Thank you for that. Oh, interesting. Number 67 car is, uh, is, is losing ground quite rapidly to number four which is very strange, isn't it? Because that's normally the car that shows great fuel consumption, although more so with uh, Westbrook than uh, Briscoe. And Fizzy's now only two seconds behind Indeed, Ryan Briscoe. Indeed, closed up rapidly. I mean, it was, it was six seconds, four seconds, and now two on the last three laps. But Fizzy's hardly closing down on the leader. He's still 31 seconds behind that, the leader, so as exactly. you see, that's Briscoe coming back Indeed. towards him. Yeah. Alexander Sims, by the way, doing a cracking job, lapping in the low to mid-42s while still trying to save fuel in the 25 car. The 24 is Martin Tomczyk uh, behind the wheel. Sellers is, is hemorrhaging ground rapidly now. I wonder to, if they're uh, in fuel trouble as well. Um, he was last in on lap 56, so that's quite a long time yeah, he ago was, as he well. Was, he's yeah, one of the first cars yeah, he in. Was. That, that, that's what it is for that car, for sure. Yeah, he's a good couple of laps, at least worse well, off they had fuel. The, they had the puncture, did they? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And we thought they might be in with it. That was about an hour to go for them. Because uh, they are three laps down on the leading cars. Martin Tomczyk still racing on. Never give up. Never surrender. That was uh, power steering issues for the 24 car that dropped them 11 laps. They came back onto the track, sitting in 22nd position and still 11 laps away from their teammates. So nothing lost, but nothing gained. Shea Adam, news of another retirement. The number 15 Lexus pulled behind the wall and with just 18 and a half minutes to go, they're not gonna be able to get that fixed and get it back out. So that is another retirement in GTD. Thank you, Shea. So that is the 75 Mercedes-Benz, the 93 and 86 Acuras, and now the 15 Lexus all retired. Fisichella has now dropped back from Ryan Briscoe and also from the leader. That was a slow lap from Fisichella there, a 44-2. He's in traffic, isn't he?
Mansour coming down into the last 17 minutes. We're live trackside for IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together. Alexander Sim lead by just two, 10.2 seconds now. Tony Garcia trying to chase him down. The quiet Spaniard lets the stopwatch do the talking. Uh, yeah, uh, but you know, clearly Alexander Sims is having to save fuel here, OK? So he's not uh, able to push that car to where it, where it is ultimately capable of. But his last several laps, let's look at them. 42.9, 42.7, 42.4, 42.1, 42.4, 42 You know, considering the fact uh, there's not constant traffic here, certainly, but uh, that's really good, consistent lap times by the race leader. Uh, and that's what he needs to do. He's got to keep that pace up without, uh, at the same time, saving fuel. Push He's without risk. Done. As oh. Lena Gage used to say to her drivers at Audi, push yeah. without risk. <laughs> And save fuel, by the way. The, the Corvette in second place really is uh, stretching away now from Dirk Muller. I must admit, I'm surprised by that. Now, here's a problem for the BMW that's leading. He's trying to save fuel, Owen, Owen Trinkler alongside us in the booth here, but he's got battling GT Daytona cars ahead of him. Alessandro Balzan in fifth. He's right up with Brian Sellers in fourth, yeah. who's also slave, saving fuel. And he's got to find some way past these two cars, which are both very quick in a straight line. And yep. save fuel. Then they are. And, and coming into turn one, they've got ABS too, so they can break deep also. So we'll see what kind of run he gets out of a hog pin here out of 17, if he gets a run up the inside here, which he does. And uh, the 63 probably is going to give that to him. They're in championship mode. And looks like he's going to be clear in here. And Brian's going to be the next one he's going to go after. Ooh, has to avoid the 73 park place. Car on the inside with Jörg Bergmeister. He is in 10th position. Ah, off. Uh, that's good at Jeanette, who's gone off at the first corner. Sixth place in class. He'd yeah, and he was closing. He had been job. closing down for a little while on those guys, but uh, clearly that is. In fact, he's lost a lap to them now, of course, as the leader goes by Brian Sellers. Brian doing exactly the right thing, just delayed his turn in to turn four by a couple of cars lengths, and the leader's through. Has cost himself a little bit of time, and Balzan's right on his tailgate, but he can defend up the hill. Through comes Jens Klingmann, still one second behind Corey Lewis. I said Corey Lewis had no place to hide, Jeremy, during this last stint. Interesting tactics from Change Racing, not putting Corey in in the middle stint, electing to put Mull in for the two uh, opening stints. Maybe they thought they would get a bigger gap, but I've got to say, I've been impressed with Corey Lewis. In this yes. stint, the pressure is on, and he's, at the moment, he is, he is handling that pressure. Well, he has been doing it all the way through. And in fact, we saw yesterday in the first, it was the first practice session, wasn't it? The fastest time was set by Jerome Moore. Second fastest time in the session was set by Corey Lewis in the same car. We talked about it then, that, that consistency of lap times between the two team drivers is really, really important. Splash of fuel for Lawson Aschenbach in the 57 Audi. He was last in on lap 49. Martin Tomczyk is going behind the wall. That is the BMW, which had power steering issues earlier on. They can't make up any positions. They won't lose any positions either from there. Ninth, the best that they can do in class. Right, who's your money on here, Owen? Corey Lewis to hold off the charging Jens Klingman. Lamborghini versus BMW. I think Corey's going to hang on to it here. I mean, he's got 15 minutes to go, or just under 15 minutes to go here. And uh, home track for these guys. I know he's got probably a lot of laps here also. He's local in the area, I think in Charlotte area. So you should just, you know, hit your marks. Don't worry about what's behind you right now. Now, what about the front of the field? Two great battles there. Ten seconds under that now. Nine and a half, nearly nine seconds. Garcia and Alice, uh, Alexander Sims are battling. But third place now has really been disputed with Dirk Muller and Tommy Milner right in his wheel tracks. And... Uh, just a lap or so ago, the 66 car pushing hard, Dirk Muller, hitting every kerb and wasn't doing his cause too much good. And Tommy Milner is right on him now. This is Ford. It was Ford versus Ferrari earlier on. It's now Ford versus Corvette. Shea Adam down in the pit lane. There's a problem for the leader. The 25 BMW crew just scrambled to attention. They are putting four new Michelin tires up on the wall. Could this be another puncture for the leading car? They also have the fuel rig ready, so they're going to make sure that they were okay on that. This is it. 
Meantime, the battle for one at the moment is third position. Comes down the back straight, right, left, right again. They're leaning on each other. The outside Michelin's of Tommy Milner's car were on the grass for a moment or two, but he still eased ahead. He fainted one way, then the other, this side by side, <laughs> into the... Oh, oh they're both going to go off. They're both going to go off at the top of the hill at the roller coaster. And, oh, and then the Ford runs into the front of the Corvette for good measure. These were the two that crashed at Lime Rock, remember? And the 25 is in. Bad news for new one leader. Corvette, new leader, the other one. But this is great news for Alexander Sims. He's only going to lose a couple of positions. They're still rally crossing back up the track at turn 14, 15 and 16. And just one tyre, I believe, just one tyre. The left, left front for the BMW share. Left front and the slight deranged bodywork on the nose of that 25 BMW, John. It had contact with somebody. Did they put fuel in it as well? They did a splash. That makes it, that's great because if you're going to do that, you might as well get him to the end so they can set him on full attack mode. He's only dropped down to fourth position because of the Milner and Muller thing. Yeah, but he's a long way back. But guess what? And only 11 minutes, 11 and a half minutes to go. Guess what? Here we are, there's a replay of. And it's banged up there. And the, the, Tommy Milner just lost it, didn't he? Uh, yeah. It's, it's a pretty substantial kink to the left there before you turn right for the roller coaster. It is, uh, yeah. Owen, and he lost it. Here we are on board with, on board with the four. Yes, we got the Corvette here to the right. He's passed him at that point as they come up to the, uh, the, the smaller towards the rise. end of the straight. Look at the four coming back. Comes back. Top speed, isn't that interesting? Yes, it is. And it really, oh, OK. He gets pushed out wide, doesn't he? Yeah, the, the, the Ford was... got pushed off wide. I don't think the Ford was really on the racing line wasn't, there. Wasn't interested in that left-hand left uh, apex, He wasn't was going he? left. He yeah. wasn't going <laughs> left. <laughs> Thank you to the racing driver. Yeah. Mm. What are that? A portion blame? I mean... Yeah. Uh, you Both know, of them. Ten no, minutes I, I to go. I'm not going to blame one, one more yeah, than the other yeah, for that you got, one. you got ten minutes to go here. Yeah. I mean, we're getting down to crunch time with checkered flag ready to come out here. So good race in there. But the biggest yeah. thing, side draft though. He side drafted yeah, back yeah. upon him though. Yeah, yeah. Ah, good point. Very good point. Uh, and all of a sudden, Giuseppe Ricci's car's back on the podium and just uh, nine tenths of a second away from second place behind Ryan Briscoe. What's happened to Briscoe last time around? He had a relatively slow lap. No, it was just fizzy being fizzy again. Oh my goodness, the fairy tale is still on. Extraordinary stuff. Sims goes across the line, now in fourth position. Cruel look for that 25 BMW of Alexander Sims and Bill Oberlin. Now, guys, uh, we're going to see what Sims has got now. Yes. He's got plenty of fuel now. Correct. Good point. Slightly deranged uh, bonnet on the right front of that car. It's just popping up a little bit as the car picks up speed. Now, we didn't see flailing rubber on that car, so I didn't think there was any damage. Oh, he's throwing that car around. But there is just a little bit of a panel gap between the headlight on the right-hand side of that BMW and the, the bonnet itself. He's got a Porsche ahead of him. And I think that must be Jimmy... No, that must be Patrick Peele that he's got in front of him in the 911. Is indeed. Uh, Shea Adam has been asking the tough question down in the pit lane with nine and a half minutes to go and gives us this Continental Tire update. A stern nod from Doug Feehan lets me know that the three Corvette is good on fuel. Yeah. 17. That was the, last, the two Corvettes are the last cars to come on right. to pit lane at that final stop with 52 minutes to go. That's absolutely no problem at all. It's been a, a great strategy once again from that team uh, and perfect execution from the drivers. No mistakes, at least from uh, number three car. Listen carefully, because Doug Feehan will tell you this after. Listen, that's people shooting themselves in the foot. And the right Corvette as well, the Corvette that's leading the Drivers' Championship, is once again gifted the position. Now, again, Doug, Danny Binks, the rest of the team executed perfectly today. And Jan Magnus and Antonio Garcia put themselves in a position they might have expected fourth position today, maybe third. They're going to get substantially better than that with a 17-second lead. Who's going to be second? Who's going to be second here? Giancarlo Fisichella, having been uh, eased off the road or fallen off the road at turn three. He's right in behind Ryan Briscoe, whose pace has dropped off a little bit. I say that, and he's picked it back up again. 
That's the 67 car. Milner and Mulner are 17, six, 17 seconds apart, so hopefully that won't end up in handbags. And they won't have to go to the podium. Oh, dear me, what a finish. And Jens Klingman now half a second behind yeah, it's been the no Lamborghini. Been no to tell now for the last uh, eight, ten laps. More than that. He's got some lap traffic in front of him. The Lexus, which is strong down the straightaway, they'll know the Lamborghini is also, but we'll see yeah. how easy this is going to be. Lamborghini coming up to put a lap on the Lexus, which pulls over to driver's right. That's really, really gentlemanly driving. I think that was Sage so, Karen, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is actually really good. Uh, he's done really well there. And just didn't get involved he at all. He himself there, hasn't he? Well, yeah. uh, that's the battle for the lead in GTD going by him. But, you know, two things there. First of all, the team's had to tell him that. He's seen the blue flag, obviously, but the team will have said, when you see the blue flag, that's the battle for the lead. Well, and someday it's going to come back in his favour also. And we yeah. remember that as drivers. Corey Lewis and, and Klingman will remember that. And, you know, if he's behind them battling for the lead, that they'll do the same thing for him. I mean, we all want to win, but when you're laps down like they are, you know, you need to do the right thing and let yeah. the bat look yeah, a couple of laps down that car now as a result of the uh, penalty primarily early on. Do you know what I was saying about the uh, the BMW number 25, Alexander Sims, she's having a bit of a panel gap over the right headlight. Now, I know it's not the same type of BMW, but the Klingman car's got exactly the same. And the right-hand side of the hood, the bonnet is just flapping down the front straight and, and around the... Uh, the, sorry, the yeah, the right-hand side of the bonnet is just flapping down the front straight and round the faster parts of the circuit. Just the, noticed uh, that. Oh, Corey Lewis is really leaning on that Lambo. Good for you. Mm. Uh, uh, and after making that pit stop, Alexander Simpson is making no ground whatsoever on the cars in front of him. Uh, in fact, he's losing ground to the uh, second and third place cars. That's interesting, isn't it? It is, rather. Tommy Milner in fifth position. That four Corvette. Uh, hasn't really featured when Tommy Milner got back into it after the pit stops. Um, he obviously had that... Well, he, he sorry, no, I'd, I'd tell a complete, that's yeah. a complete lie, because he's had the, the ding with Muller. That's what's pushed him back. Yeah, my apologies. And they were battling uh, at the sharp end of the field. Fizzy Keller now right with Ryan Briscoe. Where's the 48 car? In the pit lane, Shea Adam, they were struggling. We thought they might be struggling on fuel, struggling too much. Nope, left rear oh. again. Oh, that was interesting. Where, where, where was it that... Uh, it Watkins Glen. Yeah, that uh, it was Madison Snow was getting... Madison Snow, and, and this time, time after time, it's Brian this Brian. time. Yeah. Mm, curious. Yeah, well, that is... A good result for them disappearing. And guess what? See, there's another championship leader. We're talking about the championship leader in GTLM going to the head of the field. Alessandro Balzan, fourth position. Fourth position. Yeah. From a car that sat in sixth and seventh and fifth and eighth all the way through the day. Hasn't gotten involved in any battles that they didn't need to. Going to come away, probably increasing the championship lead here. Yeah, everybody else make mistakes today, and they're there at the end. I told you, quiet, they were quiet were moving up through the field here, and now they're sitting fourth. Yeah, brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. And the battle for the lead is on in that category, going up the hill now, through the snake. <laughs> Corey Lewis, a lot of people tweeting at IMSA Radio saying, you know, why was Corey Lewis not put in in the middle stint? Well, you're going to see if that is paid off. Uh, don't forget, we're coming after the chequered flag with Michelin Post Race Tech. Let's have your questions, observations, points arising from any of the racing this weekend here at VIR. At IMSA Radio, hashtag Michelin PRT, and your Spirit of the Race nominations as well, please. And that will be V-I-R-S-O-T-R. So VIR, Spirit of the Race, Hashtag V-I-R-S-O-T-R, again, to at IMSA Radio, please. And, well, I'm going to say Risi Competizione, for one. And Fissi fighting back. He's dropped back to 1.2 seconds, but they're still going to be on the podium by the look of it. I'll also put in there the, the uh, 33 car, having lost one of their drivers earlier in the week because of the hurricane. 
men having their head home. Still looking like a podium there. Don't have to vote for any of those. Jeremy, spirit of the race, what do you reckon? Yeah, no, I don't disagree with either of those two, certainly. And uh, yeah, change racing, they've worked awfully yes. hard. Yeah. They've had all sorts of uh, bad luck. They've had two poles in a row. Uh, and it's been an absolutely exemplary performance by both both of these two drivers all weekend long. Uh, and uh, within th with, with inside three minutes to go now, there's the race leader. Are we going to get one lap or two? Probably race leader two. coming through to complete a lap now. Just. 9-1-2, in and out. Jimmy Bruni just with a splash of fuel. Yeah, they were the first cars in the uh, Porsches. Yeah, Jensen they have not been consumption. on the first no. today. Struggle with fuel consumption as well, just a compound of misery. Uh, Ryan Briscoe, as the leader goes across leader. the line. So be right. two more laps. Ryan Briscoe, yellow card, if you will, blocking on Giancarlo Fisichella, who's dropped back 1.2 seconds. Race control. He was close enough. Uh, well, he was for a while, but he's dropped back a little bit now. So, Giancarlo Fisichella wanting to try and put a bit more... Well, he's back there now <laughs> in turn one. So, Ryan Briscoe has been warned for blocking. The team will have been told. The team will have got on the radio. He will have said when he heard that to the team, what, what are they talking about? It wasn't me, I never did it. <laughs> yeah, they're closing in on the 63 here, so there's another Ferrari. <laughs> oh my goodness. And that's the championship leading car in GT Daytona, fourth position in the class. And Ryan wanting to be by. Giancarlo flashing his lights as well. Maybe one more lap from Giancarlo to get back into second place, went round the inside, going in through turn nine to turn 10. Balzan gave him room. That was really, really impressive by both of the Ferrari drivers. I'm not sure I've seen two cars go side by side there before. Yeah, you can only do that if, if the other driver really lifts off the gas there, and that's what Balzan probably did there to give the 62 car the inside. Well. Corey Lewis still holds on to the lead in GTD by three quarters of a second. And Klingman's not had that, that, that opportunity to get in. Corvetta on the wall. There'll be one more lap for that car. White, la white flag, white flag. So one more lap for Tonio Garcia. He's just gone through. Shea Adam. They look like they're expecting a pit stop, though. Uh, the number four crew is on the wall holding one single Michelin. Oh, you're kidding me. Nope. I wish I was. Oh, what a day. We've seen that movie as well before, haven't we? Yes, we have. Isn't this where we came in, as they say? <laughs> uh, hashtags for the Spirit this of... battle for second, though, and they were pretty close as they went past us to begin their final lap. Well, Corey Lewis, I think, has done just about enough. Oh, he's behind a Corvette, which is moving slowly. It's the number four car. Can't believe it. Tommy Milner going slowly, and here comes the battle for the lead in towards their last lap. Corey Lewis goes immediately to driver's right to defend, and the slippery Lamborghini just about holds on going into turn one, but he's three quarters of a second has disappeared, and it was 0.18, one of a second across the line. Now down into turn one, the horseshoe. This is an extraordinary turn of events. Corey Lewis, I thought, had done enough. But Tommy Milner limping back to the pits. Left front puncture for Milner. Unwittingly getting involved in the GTD battle. No, I'm, I'm not uh, calling any issue there from Tommy. Not his fault at all. He was just trying to get back to the pits. These are the breaks in racing. And it's a battle for second as well. Fisichella right up behind Briscoe. Half a second as they went across the line, not even that now. They're coming down to the end of the lap. Tonio Garcia will increase his and Jan Magnussen's lead in the Drivers' Championship. It's another victory for Corvette that they weren't expecting. Brilliant stuff from them. And a car that is unmarked. It will be Briscoe in second. And Fisichella on the return to the championship of Risi Competizione, a first place. Given away, taken away, delete as appropriate, but third place on the podium for, for Fisichella and Vlander. Now, GT Daytona, how about Spirit of the Race for 
Change Racing and for Corey Lewis, who has been under pressure since he got into that car on lap number 61. And he comes round to complete lap number 91, and he will win not just the first win for Change, the first time they've been on the podium. Lamborghini once again wins at VIR, but this time it's Sharon Mull, Air Mull from pole position, and Corey Lewis closes it off, and that is the first time since 2016 at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca, the 23 GTD Porsche of Farmbacker and Alex Ribeiras led flag to flag, and it's been done again today. Let's go down to GT Le Mans winners now, the three car, and I suspect, Shea Adam, the Doug Feehan might have a big grin on his face. He has a big grin and a semi-perplexed look on his face. Does Doug Feehan? And Doug, I'm buying you a new sticker for the back of that car. It's a lot more than 100 wins you got now. This one came unexpectedly, though, didn't it? Well, I got to tell you, at the start of the day, if you'd have told me this was going to happen, I'd say, you know, the chances were pretty slim. But once again, it's a testament, I think, to our entire group, the strategy group, our engineers, the setup, certainly the drivers. And uh, obviously, we, we take advantage of every opportunity that's presented. And over the long run, I think that's what's, uh, that's what's caused us to be as good as we are. Winning a lot of championships, you further extend the lead. Congrats today, Doug. We got two big races to go, but uh, we're in the fight, and we like that. Yeah, and you're right, Dix. Then the, the driver's point lead, but probably more importantly, or just as importantly for Chevrolet, they moved back into the lead in the Manufacturers' Championship. They came in here as a result of the win for Ford last time out, one point behind. They'll now be two points ahead going into the <laughs> final two races of the season. Fabulous stuff. They could have done with Fisichella getting past Briscoe, couldn't they, to just uh, ease them out uh, a little yes. bit more. In GT Daytona, what a run for Corey Lewis. Jens Klingman, the uh, favoured young driver of BMW, unable to close him down and take the victory in the end. Uh, he tried hard, but really didn't get to a position where he was side by side and had to make Corey, Corey make a decision. That was a great run. Cor uh, Corey and Change Racing and your own Mull being almost picture perfect all weekend. They had oh, a pole brilliant. position and have yeah. won the race, not headed on the track. Yeah, brilliant drive by both of those two. They've really done an excellent job and uh, so well deserved for Robbie Benton's team. Uh, and being their home race, you know, they had the fastest lap here last season in the GT Daydona class. That was Spencer, Spent, uh, Spencer Pompelli. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally, though, that first win, and it's been absolutely a dominant performance for them this weekend. And behind the Ford in second place, Ryan Briscoe and uh, Richard Westbrook deserve some credit for that. That was the car that was seemingly off the pace earlier on, but they came through in the end. By the way, that's the sixth different manufacturer to win in GT Daytona this season. Right. And the, uh, the uh, championship GTD Manufacturers Championship leader uh, is uh, Ferrari, which hasn't yet won a race. Actually... Is it Ferrari so? Well, they've yes. come through in uh, fourth no, position. No, because the Mercedes was ahead of it, uh, and they were, there was just one point between them coming this weekend, so that would move Mercedes ahead of Ferrari. So, Blinker Morland and uh, Trent Hin Hinman, Hinman yeah, are doing great a great job there. Uh, let's hear from Jerome Mull. Air Mull, two stints at the beginning. Uh, it looked like an interesting strategy call, but Corey Lewis is the closer. That's what we're going to have to call him now, Shea. Heck of a weekend for your own mole. You got a new nickname out of all this, but you got the first win in the U.S., the first win in the series. How good does it feel to be a race winner? Oh, it's uh, indescribable. We've been waiting for a success like this for so long. It took us 10 races to get here. We've been so close already from the second race in Sebring, close to a podium. Uh, pole position, Road America, but this weekend was our weekend, apparently. We hit a straight home run won every single session. It was way too close for my liking at the end of this race. But Corey did an awesome job bringing it home. Big thanks to Change Racing for preparing such an awesome racing car, uh, supported obviously by our partners, uh, Microsoft, Xbox, Forza, Monster Energy, Orion Lighting. The Continental Tires did an awesome job for us this weekend, providing us with the grip we needed. And I'm... Um, that's a lot of words for a guy lost for words, but uh, just absolutely over the moon. Well, the other superstar of the day, Corey Lewis, has made it back in. I'll let you go over to your superstar teammate and celebrate with him. Jerome Mull can barely contain his excitement as Corey Lewis punching the steering wheel. What a drive from the American and the guy from the Netherlands. 
Yeah, Corey Lewis really impressing. We've been seeing this all season about how his driving, how his confidence has been increasing race on race. And he had uh, one of the rising stars, certainly BMW, think of a whole lot of Jens Klingman. He has been somewhat impulsive at times, but he's been retained by BMW and uh, Turner Motorsport could not get that pass made, couldn't get close to Corey Lewis, close enough to make it. And under that kind of pressure, that was a pro performance from Corey Lewis. Owen Trinkler was watching that alongside us. I'm impressed by that, I really am. Well, surprise pressure too at the end because that really wasn't his mistake that got good him point. In, in that position there. And then he got on the outside of the track. We talked about picking up some all the rubber and stuff and picking up the dirt there. He went into turn one, that car drove off turn one and got a good run. And once he did that, I feel like he was pretty in the clear there coming to the checker. Because in his mind, with three quarters of a second or a second, he knows if he doesn't make a mistake coming into the last lap, he's all right. And then that evaporates coming out of the last corner. The, the last Last place on earth that you want to lose momentum here coming out of the last corner. Oh, no, out of hog pin, out of 17, that's where you want to be able to put the power down early. And Milner was just trying to get back to the pits. He, was, he wasn't doing anything wrong there, and it was just a great drive by Corey. Uh, Shea Adam is down by Corey Lewis. Uh, we'll allow the guys from uh, television to have a chat. There's such emotional scenes down there at the moment, Shea. I'm not even sure they're going to be able to get a chat with them, John, because Corey got out of the car, big hug to his co-driver, Jerome Mole, who we just heard from, and he pulled his visor down because he is actually crying. So right now, a very, very emotional win for Corey Lewis. First podium Don't have a problem of with that. the series no. and first win. What a way to do it. Don't have a problem with that. Uh, anybody who thinks this isn't important to people, whether they're pro drivers and have been around for a long time, or like Corey, just uh, making his way through his career. That I mean, I like to see emotion. That means yes. something to him. And that was a great, great drive. Ryan Briscoe, second place. Uh, Giancarlo Fisichella, it should be said, did get back up into third. Uh, as we were mentioning, did get the fastest lap as well for uh, Dave Sims, for uh, the Risi Competizione team as well. But that was a race win for Ferrari, Jeremy, that got away. Now, oh, and BMW, yeah. Well, yeah, certainly mm -hmm. BMW would have been in with a chance. But whether Fisichella could have overhauled Sims or not, uh, we don't know what happened at turn three. So we'll re reserve judgment on that until we've spoken uh, to the parties concerned, which was Jens Klingman and uh, Giancarlo Fisichella. That might be an interesting interview with uh, those two. Can be quite fiery uh, at times. Uh, Owen Trinkler alongside us um, on the other side of the fence, as it were, from your normal driving duties. What did you make of that race in both classes today? Awesome race. We talked about keys to victory here. No mistakes. Drivers, crew, everybody and Corvette went top of the board and won the race by doing that. And then the 16 car, they just kept the momentum going. They showed up off the truck fast and they kept that going. They won practice and they won the race. In our Michelin countdown to green, as Owen rightly says, we talked about no mistakes, handle the pressure, the passing zones, Jeremy, and some people did that much better yeah. than others. And we did run all green. And, you know, that is something that was uh, perhaps unexpected. Corey's got his helmet off. He's being congratulated by Jerome Mull and Shea Adam will speak to him now. Corey, the closer, Lewis. Holy cow, man. Your first time getting a trophy in this series and it comes for the top step. You dominated this weekend. You and your own did. We talked to your own and he said it was just a perfect weekend. How are you feeling right now? Uh, I'm speechless. I think that's the best way to put it. That was an uh, absolutely unbelievable weekend through and through. Uh, Jerome did an amazing opening double stint, really. And uh, handed me the car off right where we needed to be. And I was able to hold off the Turner boys, which was not an easy feat. And it was a little bit too much uh, excitement than I wanted. But, uh, you know, if we're going to win our first race as a team and the first race as myself, uh, I'd rather work for it. Well, and this was a home track for the team, so it means a little bit more. But that last lap, when you saw the Turner BMW closing in on you, did you see your life flashing before your eyes? Well, a little bit. And uh, like you said, this is a hometown race for us in Lamborghini Carolinas and Eddie Littlefield and our dealer principal. It's, it's uh, great to have them all here. But uh, when the Turner guys got really close, I was like, uh-oh. Uh, got to hold my breath there. This last lap isn't going to be as easy as I thought it was, but uh, we're able to hold off, and I just can't thank this team enough. Jay did an amazing job. Uh, everybody at Change Racing Organization, thank you so much. This is amazing for our first one. Congrats to the whole team. Thank you. Uh, Mull and the Closer. Uh, we have a couple of new <laughs> nicknames from those guys. They are a 
I think that's a team uh, in the very early stages of a very bad hangover by tomorrow morning. That is going to be one heck of a party. Yeah. Uh, we are going straight to Michelin Post Race Tech. We'll hand the PA an 89.9 and back to Tony Laporta for the formalities. Don't forget, a couple of weeks' time, we'll be doing it all over again at Mazda Raceway Laguna Sega. And then our season finale is at Road Atlanta for the Petit Le Mans. And you'll be able to join it all here live on IMSA Radio. Stay tuned, your international listeners or those of you tuned in uh, around the world for Michelin Post Race Tech, which starts next on IMSA Radio.